Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's meeting of the Tulare County Board of Supervisors. It's not often that there's standing room only. Uh, you all probably showed up to see Mike Ennis, and he's not even here. So um, he's actually running a little bit late and will be joining us shortly. Uh, please stand with me as we salute the flag of this great country and remain standing for a moment of silence. We will be led today by Supervisor Shuckley. Please join me in saluting our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, we're going to go ahead and kick this meeting off and start off with item number one, and that's Board of Supervisors Matters, and I will look to uh, Supervisor Worthley. He who wears the brightest tie speaks first. Well, that's because I'm going to a Giants game this Saturday. Yeah. So I've got my Giant uh, stuff on today. You know, it's been, uh, as always, it seems like there's never a, a, a slow time around here, but um, we had our, our San Joaquin Valley infrastructure, water infrastructure meeting uh, last Friday in Fresno. Um, the board will be going to, as I'm sure, point out our chairman to D.C. next week. And so it's just, uh, as always, there's always plenty of things to be, to, to be done. And uh, the Air District met last Thursday in Fresno. Um, our Kings River GSA met also on Thursday. I, one, one little factoid I thought was interesting is that talking about our weather and the rain and snow that we've had, it's anticipated the runoff on the Kings River this year will be the equivalent of the last five years combined. Mm. So in one year, we're at almost 200% of normal. And as of today, we've lost about a half a million acre feet of water to the San Francisco Bay because of flood releases. So uh, it's a great water year. It's only sorry, only sorry we can't hang on to more of it as we lose some of it out of the area. But uh, otherwise, that's all I have today. Mr. All right. Supervisor Shuckley. Uh, yeah. Last, uh, last week, I attended the San Joaquin Valley College 40th anniversary. Uh, local private junior college here. They have sent uh, more than 25,000 students through their different programs. So it was uh, uh, quite a nice event that they had out there. On Saturday, I uh, celebrated Earth Day uh, with the city of Isalia and also the ribbon cutting of the Mickey City Park, which is a sister city to the sister of Isalia. And they had a delegation there uh, from Mickey City, Japan, Japan to enjoy that. Um, also last week, Supervisor Crocker and I, and I uh, completed our third and final installment of our new Supervisor Institute with CSAC. So I guess we're official now, huh? We made it. We made it, yeah. <laughs> Who was valedictorian? I was. <laughs> People lost money. <laughs> <laughs> um, last night I uh, went to Fresno State, was invited there, and attended the uh, uh, memorial for the uh, Armenian Genocide, the 102nd uh, commemoration of that at Fresno State. And then this Saturday I will be attending, and I encourage all those to also attend that can, the Sierra K-9 trials that we will have. Uh, it'll be nice to root for the uh, Sheriff's Department dogs, K-9s, and that'll be held, I believe, it's just beginning at 10 a.m. at uh, Central Valley Christian High School there in the stadium. And also next Wednesday I will be attending, I guess on behalf of the board also, because you guys will all be in D.C., the uh, Peace Officers Memorial right out here at our Peace Officers Memorial site. So that's it. All right. Thank you very much. You know, she was talking about Earth Day. I thought she was going to start talking about 420, so I'm glad that you didn't uh, <laughs> celebrate that holiday, Supervisor. Uh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> we were in Sacramento. Supervisor oh, yeah. Crocker, what do you got? What happens in Sacramento? Uh, no. Um, last week was a great busy week. Uh, I had a, the opportunity to participate with the Porterville Unified's uh, Career Pathways uh, I don't know if it's actually a career day, but it, it's it's something similar to a career day uh, last Friday, and that was great to see all the different young people that are. Um, it, it seems like education's a lot uh, different, where it's a lot more focused on career pathways. I guess uh, hence the why they have pathways program. But it, it was it was great to see that uh, what the school district is doing and innovating. And Saturday we had a, a great turnout for the Farmersville Library Grand Opening. Um, it's, I think it's been long overdue, and there's a lot of 
hard work that uh, our county staff and the city of Farmersville, as well as many different uh, community organizations have put into uh, restoring a library and really making something that's that's much improved from what has ever been in that community before. It's uh, It's been a great partnership uh, where uh, the community, the Farmersville Community Center, not only houses a library but also houses their senior center and uh, the boys and girls club and so it's it there's there's a there's great synergy i i feel that's going to come out of that one facility uh for for that community and it's um really something that uh, i would encourage our other community partners to look at for for additional communities i think there's a it makes a lot of sense where we can share resources for one facility and yet have a great deal of uses for it um, yesterday, we had a, an East Kauia Ground Sustainability Agency meeting, and um, the overlap is still not quite uh, resolved, um, and so I'm, I will be working on setting up some meetings. Um, we're, we're just at the final points, um, and, and it's, I, I don't think that it's not anything that can't be overcome, but there's still some work that needs to be done. Uh, and, but, but one of the positive things that I saw out of that as well is that, uh, the East Kauia, we decided to move forward with, uh, the, the WRI that, uh, the Kauia Delta Conservation District had already, uh, completed outside of the Sigma process, outside of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And so we'll all be utilizing data from the same, uh, for, uh, the, the same sources, the same methodology, uh, which which means that basically that there's that much less coordination that is going to be required later on in the process because we'll all be using the same set of data. And it's, uh, it, you know, despite the fact that there's still some overlap, um, it, that was, I thought, a huge step forward as far as um, a good faith effort in cooperating and coordinating uh, for the future. It doesn't necessarily bind anyone in, but it, it shows that um, there's a willingness to to utilize um, something that's already been created rather than reinvent the wheel. So it's it very positive. Uh, this afternoon I'll be traveling to uh, Corning, the current home of Lindsay Olives. Uh, it's 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 sad for me to say that, but uh, but I, I will. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, what, the RCRC board meeting is is up there and it's being hosted by Tehama County. And uh, it'll be tomorrow and uh, Thursday, and we'll be discussing all the rural issues. And uh, I don't have anything else. Well, I'm sure glad we put you on RCRC. Uh, <laughs> Supervisor Ennis. Am I the last? You're, hey, that, that's why they're standing well, room only, because you, you actually was, showed up. So they wanted lucky. to be here for you. I'm lucky to be here. You know, I know, how those, Bruce. I know how those guys feel uh, uh, when they're driving in that uh, Sprint Cup series and something blows. Well, I blew a hose, and let me tell you, vapor and everybody backed off. Luckily, I was over there by the Strathmore. I mean, yeah, actually, I would call it the Lindsay uh, Fire Station out there by Karen's Corner. So I left my unit there, and my mother-in-law come and pick me up, and I went back and got a different unit. So she brought you. So I'm here. And Your mother's glad to be here. Uh, plus, I had to talk on the radio, and I was late already because when I mean, you're talking on the radio. But yeah, I uh, yesterday I had an opportunity uh, to go out to the jail site where we're building a new jail. And Darren Johns, who's a very good friend of mine, is one of the guys on the management crew with the, uh, that's building this thing. And I had no idea. Uh, they bring these, they pour these walls down in Wasco, and then they haul them in by these big uh, flatbed trucks, big heavy-duty trucks. And they got a crane out there. They had to bring it in pieces. It's so big to do the work of lifting this stuff. Those panels on those walls are 28,000 pounds each. Mm. I mean, it's amazing to see that. They've got cable running through them for reinforcement. Uh, they've got steel plates built into them, so when they set the walls up, the guys go in and weld a steel plate to the two plates, and that seals them together. And they were doing that yesterday. And then they're putting the roof panels on, and I would say they probably weigh, I'm going to say 12 ton maybe, I mean 12 ton each. And once they get all those in place... They grout those, and then they pour four inches of concrete over the top of it. Oh. So it's amazing. The first pod is pretty much getting completed. And then when you go out and look at the ground around it, 
I mean, the conduit looks like spaghetti. And I, I don't know how in the world you ever figure out where everything's going, but I, hopefully they, they know. But it was a great, great, uh, I got my hard hat on and everything, went out there and, and walked around the facility. But, boy, what a job and uh, what the magnitude is like a giant Lego set. And it, once they get it in place, it all works against itself and just makes itself stronger. So, boy, not, it's not going to be a Shank Shaw a redemption. <laughs> you're digging out of that baby, I can tell you right now, not for at least 100 years. <laughs> but uh, that's pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty, uh, that's, that's pretty much what I got to say this morning. I was glad I got here in time to talk about that because, boy, that was really interesting yesterday to see how that thing is being built and going up. So. Mr. Chairman, I have to say it. Sure. In all the years that Mike's been on the board, I don't think I've ever rolled into the parking lot that his his car wasn't there. Yeah. So I was really, I was dumbfounded. I thought, we do have a meeting today, don't we? I was really thrown <laughs> off. I, I still feel a little bit thrown off because you weren't yeah, here. Yeah, well, this is the first time I've ever been late, but I'm, just thank God I'm here. And, and uh, my unit didn't burn up. I'm going to have somebody come pick it up. So. Yeah, I, I actually thought that you might have been at home watching the Shank Shaw Redemption. <laughs> or the Shawshank <laughs> Redemption, maybe. Shank, Shank, let me tell you, though. I've watched that movie a couple of times, and it's, it's, it's a good movie. Okay. All right. Um, moving along. Uh, so tonight at uh, 5.30 at the Wyndham uh, Hotel in Visalia is the uh, Hands-On Heroes uh, Awards Night, and I, I want to uh, uh, congratulate and recognize all the individuals who are being awarded tonight uh, and thank them for their work to uh, benefit uh, children ages 0 to 5 in our community. They do a wonderful job. Uh, this Friday at 9 a.m. at Bob Mathias Stadium in Tulare uh, will be the Tulare County Special Olympics. That's always a wonderful event, and I'm very uh, grateful to all of the uh, Kiwanis volunteers and uh, uh, community volunteers who step up and work really hard to put on a great event. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful time for all of the athletes, and they really enjoy themselves. So I look forward to uh, uh, welcoming everyone to uh, that event, and then I will be uh, heading up to Fresno for the meeting of the San Joaquin uh, Valley Insurance Authority. Uh, that will take place at 10 a.m. on Friday uh, at the Fresno Employees Retirement uh, Center. Um, and then this Saturday uh, is the, an this weekend actually, is the Antique Farm Equipment Show in Tulare uh, at the International Agri Center. And I get to do the, for the second uh, time in a row, I will be emceeing the pie eating and milk chugging contest uh, at that event. And uh, uh, boy, I tell you, from from college and not uh, not drinking alcohol as a pledge in a fraternity, chugging milk is no fun, uh, especially <laughs> when it's milked with uh, when it's mixed with Sprite. So uh, that's uh, uh, that doesn't go over very well. But uh, anyways, no, no need to talk about college experiences. Uh, we're well beyond that for everyone except for Mr. Crocker. That was only a couple of years ago for him. Um, so we will now move on to uh, item number two on our agenda, which so, is a, so uh, a recognition of Armando Apodaca. Uh, upon his retirement from the Tulare King's Hispanic Chamber of Commerce for his many years of service. So I'd like to invite Armando to come forward and uh, say a few words, and then I will follow that up with a uh, presentation of a proclamation. While he's walking up, I, I believe he was preparing a presentation because he was under the impression that he was presenting to us rather than us. <laughs> no, that, that's all right. Hey, I'll take the presentation from Armando, please. Actually, um, I'm not prepared, but I can do it off the cuff if you want. <laughs> because I thought that that's what I was going to do and how I discovered that I was going to be here is that I wanted to make a trip. I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning worrying about my presentation here and so because I was told that I didn't have a laptop and I did, wasn't going to be able to present <laughs> and so um, I got up at four and started typing up my presentation <laughs> and then in the morning I told Criselda I'm going to go down there just to check it out <laughs> and that's when she had to admit that this is what was happening <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately but thank you very much for this honor I really appreciate it um, it's something that you know, started a long time ago for me. Um, a lot of the history that goes on, I don't know, um, you know, if I should take credit for some of the things that, that I've done, but I know Viola Ginsburg and I, um, I helped her start the Creative Center, and then I ended up by helping build the fence that now surrounds it. Um, but, uh, you know, many, many things that, that I've worked with. Habitat for Humanity, I worked years and years and years with them. 
uh, many organizations that I've helped that my whole goal has always been to make this community better. Uh, it isn't to garner accolades for me, but to see that this community gets better. Um, I came from an area that I disliked when I was a young boy, and I love Visalia and Tulare County, and I always am going to stay here, and I'm going to make sure that this community becomes the best it can be by whatever effort I can put forth. Thank you. All right, Armando, it really is a, a pleasure to present this proclamation here uh, to you and congratulate you on your retirement. You really are a pillar in this community and uh, your passion for Visalia and Tulare County is evident by all that you have done to contribute here. Uh, so I'm presenting this proclamation to you, uh, honoring you on your retirement from the Tulare King's uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Whereas a longtime resident of Tulare County, Armando Apodaca has served the community for many years in various positions within a wide range of organizations. And whereas Armando's involvement in the community has been extensive and he has dedicated countless hours in hopes of making the community a better place. And whereas serving the Visalia Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors for eight years, Armando was instrumental in increasing their membership from 900 to 1,400 members and served on committees such as Oktoberfest, Christmas Tree Auction, and the annual awards for more than 20 years. Whereas during his four-year stint on the board of the Creator Center Foundation, he raised $15,000 as King of Mardi Gras in 2006. Wow, that's, that's an achievement. He served as the president of the Central Valley Chapter of the Restaurant Association for nine years while helping to raise money for student culinary scholarships. And whereas Armando currently serves on several advisory committees, such as the Tulare County Sheriff's Spot, he has helped raise funds for the Habitat for Humanity Birdhouse Auction, served on the Housing Commission in Dinuba, and has played the role of Celebrity Santa for other organizations. And whereas he is currently involved with the Lea Conmigo Committee, dedicated to bringing literacy to parents and young adults. He is also teaching high school students how to be career-oriented by providing them with business etiquette classes. And whereas, although he is retiring as the director of the Tulare King's Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, a position he has held for over two years now, the community thanks him for his many years of hard work and dedication, knowing that this is not the end of his years of service. And I have every expectation that you will continue. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Tulare County Board of Supervisors does hereby honor Armando Apodaca upon his retirement from the Tulare King's Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and thank him for his, thanks him for his many years of services and dedication to the community and Tulare County as a whole. Signed by Kyler Crocker, Pete Vanderpool, Amy Shucklin, Steve Worthley, and Michael Ennis. Thank you very much, Armando. Thank you very much. Well deserved. All right. Next, we have item number three on our agenda, which is a request to present a proclamation to adopt the month of May 2017 as Mental Health Awareness Month in Tulare County. Supervisor Shucklin. Come on over here. <laughs> it's an honor to present this proclamation uh, recognizing May 2017 as Mental Health Awareness Month. Come on, folks. <laughs> Whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well being and it can affect all areas of a person's life, including school, home, and work. And whereas one in four adults, approximately 
61.5 million Americans experience mental illness in a given year, and one in 17, about 13.6 million, live with a serious mental illness such as schizophrenia, major depression, and bipolar disorder. And whereas approximately 20% of youth ages 13 to 18 experience severe mental disorders in a given year, and for ages 8 to 15, the estimate is 13%. Whereas children of mothers who go untreated for perinatal depression are at greater risk for abuse and neglect and are more likely to have an adversarial relationship with their parent. And whereas serious mental illness costs America $193.2 billion in lost earnings per year, and individuals living with serious mental illness face an increased risk of having chronic medical conditions, which has statistically decreased life expectancy by 25 years in comparison to the general population. And whereas each business, school, government agency, healthcare provider, organization, and citizen bears the burden of mental health problems and has a responsibility to promote mental wellness and support prevention efforts, with early and effective treatment, those individuals with mental health conditions can recover and lead full, productive lives. I'm a shining example of that. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Tulare County Board of Supervisors do hereby proclaim May 2017 as Mental Health Awareness Month in Tulare County and can call upon the citizens, public and private institutions, businesses and schools in Tulare County to recommit our community to increasing awareness and understanding of mental health and the need for appropriate and accessible services for all people with mental illness. And this, of course, is signed by uh, all the members behind me and myself. So uh, with that, I'd like to congratulate you, proclaiming you. May 2017. Dr. Wood, would you like to make a few comments? I would. Sure, go for it. You can actually turn the microphone around here. You can stand back here and address the audience or address the board, however you'd like to. Well, Chairman Vanderpool and uh, Supervisor Shucklin, thank you, both of you, for your significant contributions to the Mental Health Board and your support of the Mental Health Board and the Department of Mental Health here in Tulare County. Um, Supervisor Ennis and Supervisor Crocker, Supervisor Worthley, um, Mr. Spada, thank you for your support. Council, thank you for attendance. Um, the Mental Health Board has forwarded an annual report to the Board of Supervisors for your review, which hopefully will be available to you in May, Mental Health Awareness Month. It um, gives you a state of mental health services in Tulare County and the excellent performance the Department of Mental Health has been providing to our citizens throughout the county. Mental health is a biopsychosocial disorder it's a biologic illness with psychologic implications and a significant amount of social impact. We see that even today as the Board of Supervisors has recently been working to approve and uh, establish a wellness and recovery center in Visalia with some significant, you know, community concerns, which, um, you know, um, are important for us to remember in terms of our outreach and our education and our support for our brothers and our sisters and our friends and our neighbors and our fellow citizens. One of the things that's particularly encouraging about the biopsychosocial approach is that uh, the integrated uh, Department of Health and Human Services in Tulare County is doing exactly that with uh, integration of uh, medical and uh, biologic um, approaches because many of these disorders are, in point of fact, biologic illnesses. Um, we now have a significant amount of um, interface between mental health services at public health clinics and a significant amount of uh, public health services at our mental health clinics. Psychologically, I think each and every one of us knows what it's like to be anxious or depressed or to have trouble thinking clearly or expressing ourselves um, well. Um, and what we are about to do is, again, set aside a certain amount of time 
to pay attention to how we take care of one another and how we pay attention to our responsibility to care for ourselves. From a social perspective, one of the things that's particularly encouraging to me as the current acting chair for the uh, Mental Health Board is that we are, in point of fact, paying significant attention to the community part of community mental health. We have a significant involvement with the Tule River Reservation now, including mental health first aid and suicide prevention training. The Suicide Prevention Task Force was just in Three Rivers uh, just two weeks ago in response to two suicides which occurred in our community in Three Rivers within one week. We are, I think, a community well-known for caring for one another, well-known for including all of our citizens and being sensitive to including our brothers and our sisters and our neighbors. I thank you very much for this proclamation. Um, I look forward to the fact that I was successfully able to pull off a great roster substitution, and uh, I believe that uh, Supervisor Shucklin will be throwing out that opening pitch at the Rawhide uh, <laughs> Mental Health uh, Game on uh, Cinco de Mayo. She's going to probably pitch a lot better than I would have, so that's great. And again, thank you very much for the proclamation, and thank you for supporting our friends and our neighbors and community mental health in Tulare County. Thank you for that, and I believe this is an action item. We have to uh, declare uh, May as Mental Health I, Awareness Month. I move approval to declare May 2017 as Mental Health Awareness Month in Tulare County. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor Shuckley and a second by Supervisor Crocker. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. It's always nice when they're non-controversial like that, right, guys? Um, um, the service award, or do you, you want to do? The, okay. I have a, re a request uh, on behalf of one of uh, his constituents uh, to take up uh, the consent calendar real quick before we address the uh, service awards. Um, so uh, anybody have any items they'd like to have removed from consent for separate consideration um, or uh, any member of the public like to have any item removed? I'd like to uh, pull item 24. Okay, item 24. Uh, is going to be removed. Uh, any additional items or corrections from uh, board members? Seeing none, no corrections or comments from members of the public. The chair will entertain a motion. Approval to balance the budget. For the second. Okay, we have a motion from Supervisor Worthley, a second by Supervisor Ennis. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. We'll now take up item 24. Mike Washington, the RMA. Uh, this item before you today is for a request to uh, submit an application for Department of Natural Resources Urban Greening Grant on behalf of the Cutler Rossi School District. Uh, this, this park uh, grant, the district came to the county to partner with this because they're not el eligible agency to apply for this money, so we're going to partner with the, the uh, school district. Uh, there's a community outreach meeting just recently that really described what they're looking for in this complex. The school passed a bond in 2016 that uh, dedicated $2 million towards this, and what we're looking to do in this partnership is to apply for up to another $3.5 million to make sure that this whole master plan concept is uh, developed. And um, we will have an MOU with the, the, between the county and the school district for... Um, an understanding that there is no net county cost to this. And I know that uh, Yolanda Valdez from the, the school, I believe, that's who the constituent probably is, would like to address this and mention, talk to the board about this. So. Sure. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Thank you for having us and taking the time to listen to us and hopefully providing the authority to go ahead and partner with us and, and help us with this. You know, a long time ago, a migrant counselor shared with me that when you have a dream, you have to work really hard and then share your dream with anyone that will hear it. And so about two and a half years ago, we developed this master plan for Cutler Arosi, master plan for our schools, obviously, and for the needs that our community needed. And so within this plan, we had a recreational complex, a sports uh, complex that we needed because we needed the room at Arosi High School for buildings. And so that meant that we had to move 
our uh, fields over to an adjacent property that we have, actually sandwiched right in the middle of Arosi High School and Omani Middle School. And so when sharing this dream, we shared it with uh, all of your uh, people here at the county every time they came over to uh, do a study or, 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 or uh, you know, ask us for information. Uh, we've shared it with uh, VIDAC representatives, and I know poor Steve had to, he was subjected to come sit in my office, and we shared this big dream with him as well. Well, out of that came an opportunity where an Urban Greening grant came up, and, you know, I just want to thank your uh, people, Eric, and all of his people for how wonderful they have been in exploring the opportunity along with our grant writers and, and, and our uh, business department. But this urban greening grant, the more we learned about it and we went to Fresno to learn all the details about it, we said, oh my gosh, we meet every single requirement and this could be an opportunity for us to complement our grant, our bond money that we were already dedicating towards this complex. Our bond money will only allow us to build one third of it. And with this urban greening grant, we can build all of it. And so we are hoping that you give your permission and your authority to move forward because we are an unincorporated community, as you well know, you know, your biggest unincorporated community in the county. Um, we cannot apply for this uh, urban greening grant ourselves, but we can definitely, we are definitely better together and have you, have the county uh, personnel help us and, and uh, apply for this grant. We have already been working out uh, a lot of just understanding how this whole thing would work and I believe that um, we have a very collaborative relationship we have in the past and uh, I believe that our community is, is primed to have a project such as this, and you definitely have a motivated school staff to ensure that this comes to fruition. Any questions? Any questions or comments? Just a comment, Mr. Chairman. You know, um, oftentimes you hear folks who will say, you know, I, I, they grow up in a community and they go off to get education, and oftentimes their intent is to come back and give back to the community. I want to tell you that... Yolanda Valdez is, grew up in, in Cutler, Nerosi. She has been a whirlwind of success in the education community. She has been a principal at Dynaba High School, a vice superintendent, assistant superintendent at Dynaba Schools. She's now the superintendent at Cutler, Nerosi Schools. And I just have to say to the public here, she's my personal hero. So oh. congratulations to you, Yolanda. And, uh, this is a great project. I'm very happy. This is a, a classic case of a win-win situation of taking bond funds and being able to leverage that to, be, to create a much bigger project with, with other funding that otherwise would not happen. So congratulations to you. Thank you. Our motto in Cutler Rossi is to dream big, work hard, and give back. And that's what we're encouraging all our people to do that. And I feel like I'm a great example of that with the collaboration of all of you who support us and help us reach our goals. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. So I, I, glad I, to make the motion. Go ahead. Uh, Supervisor Crocker wanted to pull this. Yeah. Um, so I, I think this is a great project just, just from the start. And this is a great collaboration, but uh, maybe for staff, uh, for Mr. Washam. So process, this is kind of a process question as far as this. I, I noticed there's, um, there's quite a bit of missing information in the application, and it's due May 1st. Yeah, you you are very observant and you read thoroughly. Yes, this is just a, this was just a draft, so you could get the gist of it. Where staff is continuing to collaborate with their grant writer and the proposed. Uh, well, there's been revisions since this, and uh, and filled in the blanks, so to speak. And by Thursday afternoon, we should have the final application completed for signature of the chair. Uh, again, this is the permission that we're seeking here is simply to apply. The details will be further down the road if, if we're awarded the grant, then through that MOU we'll get all the details, financial details uh, required to uh, make sure that the county is held whole. Okay. All right. I think I have a I'm very working. enthusiastic motion from Supervisor Worthley. Second. second. And an enthusiastic second from the question asker, uh, <laughs> Mr. Crocker. Uh, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. 
Uh, we are now going to move on to a very exciting item on our agenda, and that is item number four, a request to uh, recognize county employees for their uh, years of service here in Tulare County, and I will turn it over to our HR director, Ms. Rhonda Schuster. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Vanderpool, Supervisors, CAO Mike Spada, and Council Deanne Peterson. And also good morning to our employees and to the family members that are with you today. Today I'm honored to bring um, to our supervisors the employees who are being recognized for their long service to this county. Last Tuesday, we did um, 45 um, employees in, and gave awards to them and we're doing a similar amount today. The service award program recognizes employees who have actually completed 10 or more years of continuous service during the prior calendar year. It's noteworthy to mention that our board is recognizing employees during April, which is the month of national county government. We honor employees this year for your loyalty, your hard work, your compassion, your service ethic, and that you provide to the departments and to the citizens of Tulare County. As I read a little bit about our awardees, you're going to hear that many are good Samaritans and humanitarians in their own communities. In addition to serving the public in their work, in their private lives, they volunteer for their church, school activities, in the communities they live, and for service clubs. Many have developed special hobbies and talents that you will also hear about today. However, some of our employees are a little shy and ask that we only mention their name and their title, and so we are going to respect their wishes today. Awards for employees who have completed 10 years of service are given at the department level, and this year, we are giving 220 employees their 10-year awards. That equates to 236 that this year will receive 15 years or more years of service. Again, today there will be approximately 45 actually receiving awards. For our employees who are receiving an award today, as I call your name, please come forward to receive your award and they'll be presented in this area here. And those of you who want to take pictures may take pictures also from this area. Some of the awards have large boxes and packaging and we have preserved those for you and those are available for you to pick up in our lobby here. I would like to say that I, I'm going to apologize in advance if I mispronounce your name uh, but I will try to do my best um, to read the information you've provided and to give the correct name. So we will begin this morning with District 1, Supervisor Kyler Crocker will be presenting the service awards. And we will start with Laura Boland. Laura has 15 year service award today and is a child interview specialist with the district attorney's office. She's a graduate of Fresno State, a certified interviewer through the governor's office and a certified dog handler for Fortune, the courthouse dog, who was seen walking yesterday <laughs> in our walking works challenge. <laughs> Laura enjoys reading movies and family time. Congratulations. Steve Horton. Steve is a Staff Services Analyst 3 with the Probation Department and is getting his 15 year service award. Steve has also worked for Tulare County as a Community Development Spe Specialist and also for the Solid Waste Department. He has a Bachelor's of Science, University of Oregon in Political Science various hazmat operation certificates. His hobbies 
I'm not sure this is a hobby, but watching his children in sporting events, dance competitions, music, drama, and choir performances. <laughs> He's a resident of Three Rivers, married to Chantal Madeiras for 15 years, and has two children. Congratulations. Karen Jeffries. Karen is a legal office assistant three in the district attorney's office and is receiving her 15 year service award. She is a graduate of Exeter High School and COS and attended Fresno State. She enjoys reading, crocheting, walking on the beach, relaxing in the mountains and gardening. She is also the proud parent of one son. Congratulations. <laughs> Ricardo Ortiz. Come on down. Ricardo is a custodial worker too, receiving his 15 year service award and works with the resource management agency in the central road yard shop. He loves going to the Employee Appreciation Days, summer and winter, to win the raffle. <laughs> Congratulations, Ricardo. <laughs> Debbie Ristow, Legal Office Assistant 2, is receiving her 15-year service award from the district attorney's office. And her supervisor says, Debbie is a pleasure to work with. Congratulations. <laughs> Terry Saints. Terry is the fiscal manager for the Sheriff's Department and is receiving her 15 year service award. Terry is responsible for the Sheriff's $102 million operating budget and coordinates all activities related to the business and fiscal areas. She is also a graduate of the Tulare County Leadership Academy. She enjoys traveling with her husband Richard in their RV and enjoys spending time with her grandchildren. Congratulations, Terry. <laughs> Lieutenant Gary Hunt. Lieutenant Hunt is receiving his 20 year service award today from and is with the Sheriff's Department. He worked for the Dinuba Police Department prior to joining Tulare County. He is studying to be a beacon at St. Mary's Church in Visalia. He has two grandsons, one granddaughter, and a second granddaughter on the way. Congratulations. <laughs> Brian Parks. Brian is an IT specialist application support three with the IT department and is receiving his 20 year service award. He began with the county with the HHSA MIS totally division. He has been elected to the Tulare County Association of the United States Bowling Congress and his hobby is bowling. <laughs> <laughs> he has three daughters, all who have their bachelor's degrees, and two have their master's, and two granddaughters. Congratulations. <laughs> Scott Fanstill. Scott is receiving his 25-year service award and is currently the Solid Waste Environmental Coordinator with our Solid Waste Department whom he's worked with the entire time he has served Tulare County. Congratulations, Scott. Oh, 
but he talked to Scott. He's a longtime former neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Keith Douglas. Captain Keith is getting his 30 year service award and is with our Sheriff's Department. He has been in management for the past 15 years. He is a 2016 graduate of the LAPD Leadership Program and is currently enrolled in a bachelor's program. He enjoys working on cars, relaxing in the desert, and off-road riding. He has been married for 29 years and is active in his church. Congratulations. Sergeant Patrick Warner. Sergeant Warner is with our Sheriff's Department and is receiving his 30 year service award today. He is the past regional director of the California Crime Prevention Officers Association. His hobbies include golf, spending time with his children at their various band events, and spending time with family. He has been married almost 30 years and is the father of four, grandfather of four, and great-grandfather of three. Congratulations. Oh, oh, District 2 Supervisor Pete Vanderpool will be presenting, and we'll begin with Avilia Aldaco. Avilia is going to receive her 15-year service award. She is a child support officer too in our child services department, child support services. She enjoys watching movies and traveling and enjoys, loves her kids, Connie and Javier and her dog, Rocco. <laughs> she enjoys her job because she loves helping people. Congratulations. <laughs> William Brewster. William is a probation correctional officer too and is receiving his 15 year service award. Prior to coming to the county, he worked as a meat cutter for 13 years and also worked at a group home and then joined the probation department. He enjoys camping, barbecuing, and hanging out with his family. Thank you, too. Mirna Gomez. Mirna is receiving her 15 year service award. She is currently a legal office assistant for with our district attorney's office. And her supervisor says Mirna is a great asset to our office. Stephen Chapman. Stephen is receiving his 20 year service award. He is a training officer too with our Health and Human Services Agency. He has been honored by the California State Senate and the Lieutenant Governor for his work with Visalia Emergency Aid. He's a past board member of the American Red Cross and the Valley, Valley Musicians Benefit Fund. Congratulations. <laughs> Timothy Hudson. Timothy is receiving his 20 year service award and is a probation officer three. He began working actually for Fresno County Probation and then was hired by Tulare County. He currently supervisors and tracks registered sex offenders. He's an avid photographer and previously worked with the Clovis North High School baseball team. Vicki Lopez Estrada. 
<laughs> Vicki is receiving her 20 year service award and is currently a supervising legal office assistant with our child services, child support services department. She has also been part of the Liberty School Board since 2014 and is a proud parent of four, Sabrina, Stephanie, Edward, and Eric Estrada. Congratulations. <laughs> Rose Mary Maciel. Rose Mary Maciel is an IT Business Intelligence 3 with our IT department as getting her 20 year service award today. She started with the county as an office assistant and has worked her way into the IT area. She possesses multiple certificates in business intelligence and crystal reports. She has been married for 43 years. Congratulations, Rose. David Ritter. David is receiving a 20 year service award today and is an IT network administrator too. Prior to joining Tulare County, he had a career, a 30 year career with the US Navy. He has an associate's degree in electronics, federal communication and he has been very active as a commander of the American Legion Post. He enjoys motorcycling and amateur radio. Congratulations, David. <laughs> Raul Martin. Raul is receiving a 30 year service award today and is an assistant refuse site supervisor. He worked 17 years in ag and dairy industry before coming to Tulare County and his 30 year career so far. He's received multiple service awards <laughs> during his time with the county and has been active in coaching Tulare Western High programs. Congratulations. Linda Sward. Linda is receiving her 30 year service award and is a dietitian too. She enjoys hiking and is in fact a docent for the Sierra Foothill Conservancy. She's with the Kingsburg Friends of the Library and enjoys reading and singing with the San Joaquin Choral. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> District 3 Supervisor Amy Shucklian will be presenting and we will begin with Gilmer Maluau. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Gilmer is receiving his 15 year service award and is a graphic specialist with the District Attorney's Office. He worked in, for seven years in the Philippines and seven years in Hong Kong. Um, previously before joining the district attorney's office. He also possesses a bachelor's in ag en engineering and two years of fine arts and composition. He's the former vice president of Visalia Arts League. Congratulations, Gilmer. <laughs> Angelica Torres. Angelica is receiving a 15 year service award and is currently a sheriff's correctional deputy. She also worked with probation prior to working for the sheriffs. She enjoys basketball, running, hiking, and traveling. Congratulations. Lisa Toddy. Lisa will receive her 15 year service award 
and as a supervising child support officer. She has worked in addition to child support also for Health and Human Services Agency. She's also received the County Employee Recognition Program Certificate of Appreciation for 2009, 2015, and 2017. Her hobbies include drawing, horseback riding, and playing with her grandkids, of which she has three. Congratulations. <laughs> Bill Hewitt? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bill Yacht is receiving his 20-year service award as a probation institution supervisor. He has received recognition for graffiti abatement and is a parks and rec volunteer, very much working with the North Visalia community. Congratulations. <laughs> Bill Meek. Deputy Bill Mink, Sheriff's Deputy 2, is receiving his 20-year service award today. He started in the Sheriff's Department at the road camp, then went to work for Kerman Police Department and came back to the county. He is on the board of the Farmersville Kiwanis, enjoys camping and fishing with his children, and getting away with his wife, Marina. Congratulations. <laughs> Don Smith. Don is being honored for 20 years of service to Tulare County and is a probation officer three. He has also received an outstanding achievement in DUI enforcement during his employment and was the 2016 employee recognition. He has been the head coach of high school soccer since 1993. He enjoys traveling, camping, and spending time with his family. He's married to Christine, Kristen and is a father of five girls. Congratulations. <laughs> David Warnke. 20-year service award, and is a probation officer three. He is a certified background investigator, and he received his Associate of Arts degree from Porterville College. He enjoys playing multiple musical instruments, sings and writes music, and he has traveled to 30 states and Canada with his family. He's raised six children, and has been married for 26 years. Congratulations. <laughs> Greg White. <laughs> <laughs> Greg is a supervising investigator with the district attorney's office and is receiving a 20 year service award today. He's also worked for the sheriff as well as the district attorney's office during his employment. Congratulations. <laughs> Craig Anderson. Craig is being honored for 25 years of service and is an engineer three with the Resource Management Agency. Prior to working for Tulare County, he did work for the County of Del Norte. He enjoys running marathons and has completed 48 to date. He is in the process of trying to run a marathon in all 50 states. Congratulations, Craig Anderson. Mark Clark. Mark. Mark is receiving 
his 25 year service award and is the GIS coordinator for IT department. <laughs> <laughs> he enjoys sculpture and drawing and has two beautiful grandsons. He also has served 22 years in the Army, a lot of it in the National Guard while working for Tulare County. Congratulations, Mark. <laughs> Eric Peterson. Eric is receiving a 25-year service award today and is an IT business intelligence too with our IT department. He also worked for the Guitar Center Management in Los Angeles prior to coming to Tulare County. He enjoys photography, playing guitar and piano, and metal detecting. Congratulations, Eric Peterson. Leanne Williams. Leanne is being honored for 25 years of service and is a probation division manager. She has also worked for the Sheriff's Department and the District Attorney's Office while joining the Tulare County family. She has been married for 25 years, has one daughter graduating from high school and one daughter graduating from eighth grade. Congratulations, Leanne. Dave Bryant. Dave is going to receive his 30 year service award today as a chief planner. He has worked for the county of Tulare as a transportation engineer, a planner for a deputy CAO, and now chief planner. He enjoys recreational sports, golf, tennis, camping, fishing, enjoys the beach, and has been married for 33 years and has two children. Congratulations, Dave. <laughs> Rafael Garcia, Jr. Rafael is receiving his 35-year service award today and is an Ag and Standards Inspector for He's been married to Molly and his wonderful wife of 33 years. And when he retires, he would like to travel. He'll soon be a grandfather for the second time. Congratulations, Raphael. receiving her 20 year service award and is the assistant district attorney in the district attorney's office. She began as a witness coordinator and then worked as a law clerk while attending law school. She was the attorney of the year 2009 for the Central Valley Arson Investigators and attorney of the year in 2013 for the Exchange Club of Porterville. Congratulations, Carrie. District 4 Supervisor Steve Worthley will be presenting and we'll begin oh, with Suzanne Carranza. <laughs> Suzanne will be receiving her 20 year service award and is a child support officer three. <laughs> <laughs> Susan graduated from Dinuba High School has been involved in a family-owned antique business in Dinuba, and lives with her <coughs> granddaughter, Lena, and loves her two sons, Michael and Jesse. Congratulations, Susan. <laughs> Amy Farrell. Amy is receiving her 20-year service award today and she is the Superintendent of Traffic Control and Resource Management Agency. 
She has also graduated from Leadership Academy, and she will be representing the USA in 2017 at the Battle of the Nations Historical Medieval Armored Sword Fighting World Championships wow. <laughs> in Barcelona, Spain. Did she get a knife too? Congratulations, Amy. <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> Leonard Nunes. Leonard is being honored today receiving a 20 year service award. He is currently a construction and maintenance worker for In Resource Management Agency. He is from Arosi High School and he successfully completed our county supervising academy. He enjoys fishing, camping, hunting, and flying his drone. He is also the proud of his granddaughter, who keeps a 4.0 GPA. Congratulations. <laughs> Deputy Rhonda Pack. Deputy Pack will be receiving her 20-year service award today. She worked for the Dinuba Police Department for six years prior to coming to Tulare County. In her spare time, she enjoys scrapbooking, attending her children's many activities, and spending time with family and friends. Congratulations, Deputy Pack. <laughs> Neil Ringler. <laughs> Neil is receiving his 20 year service award today and is a refuse equipment operator one with our solid waste department. He also worked for the city of Visalia. He enjoys fishing and spending time with his family. Mario Martin. Mario is receiving his 30 year service award and is an investigator with the district attorney's office. He has also worked with our sheriff's department. Congratulations, Mario. Andrew Pacheco. being honored for, <laughs> for 35 years of service and is a planner three with our resource management agency. He's also a United States Army veteran. Congratulations, Andrew. District 5 Supervisor Mike Ennis will be presenting, and today we will be awarding to Carrie Carrillo. <coughs> Carrie is receiving a 15-year service award and is a secretary free with Resource <laughs> Management Agency. Carrie and her husband recently celebrated their 20 year wedding anniversary. They have one daughter, and they were all born and raised in Porterville. Congratulations. <laughs> and that concludes our service awards for this year. I would like to, at the, at the end, we nor normally would have a former supervisor add up all of the years of service. And in his absence, um, I have added up. And this year, for those receiving 15 years or more, we honored 4,500 years of service in the last two Tuesdays.
Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, I'll look over to my colleagues uh, to make some comments. I know that everybody likes to make uh, a few remarks after uh, this great day. So Supervisor Ennis, who's been on the board yeah. for almost 4,500 yeah. years. <laughs> great. Oh, wait. Well, you know, just looking at the groups of, of people and when one of their award winners come up and they all got, you know, we're a big family here. You know, we, we truly are. I, I, I do get emotional because we are a big family. I spent 34 years in the car business, and I still go back and see the people. I don't miss the business, but I like the people, and I continue to, to uh, interact with them and, and go by and see them all the time. So uh, it's great to see so many people with so many years of service uh, working for Tulare County because we're very proud of you, very proud of you. So keep up the good work. And hopefully you'll stay uh, for many more years until you retire. So keep up the good work. You are the face of Ca the Tulare County, and we appreciate all that you do <coughs> every day to make this a better place for all of us to live. Thank you. Supervisor Crocker. I, Supervisor Ennis, uh, he, he spoke from the heart, and I think that the rest of us feel the same way, that um, you guys are, are, are amazing individuals, and it's, it's, it's great to be able to hear the individual stories about what you're doing, all the great things that you're doing outside of employment here at the county. And um, it, it, it's for, for the newbie here, it's, it's nice to, to be able to, to start to recognize people as they come up and, and get to interact with you as we work on different issues. And so I, I thank you for your dedication and, and continued efforts um, because it's, you know, we're we're only five individuals and we can only do so much but you guys are doing the day-to-day -day work that that really makes everything run smoothly so thank you supervisor worthley thank you mr chairman <coughs> i always enjoy these days when we get to honor our employees after being on this board for this is my 19th year i've seen some of you receive these five minute five year increment awards for some time now and i don't know how you keep getting younger i i don't know how that works out <laughs> I, I guess one thought that came to my mind was, thank goodness some of you are not anxious for early retirement. Uh, and I mean that sincerely because we are the beneficiaries of your experience. Uh, and I don't just mean the job you have at the county, but so many of you bring experience from previous employment. I was amazed to think of the David Ritter, 50 years total, because I heard it correctly, he had a 30-year career in the military before a 20-year career in our county. I mean, that's just an amazing accomplishment. Um, 47 marathons. I can't even imagine that. I just, it just amazes me. You know, you people are just amazing. And then, you know, Amy Farrell off to Spain, you know, jousting or something. I mean, who, who does that? I, it's just, <laughs> Your constituents. My district four, go district four. Uh, and then I just have to comment one, uh, I, I got a kick out of uh, Patrick Warner. He's a great, great grandfather. You know, my great, great grandfather was a Civil War veteran. <laughs> <laughs> Needs to say I never met him. Uh, Mike might have, but so. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, as he said, I do. I do sense when we come together that that this does create this sense of family in our in our county, and I and that's and that is truly I think what we have, and we do appreciate you so very much. We are five policymakers. You are the people who are the boots on the ground, the feet in the office, the people who inter interact with our, our constituents. You are the folks that make it happen. And so we just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your good work. We hope that you have many more years to come, and, and thank you for being here today. It means a lot to us that you took the time to be here. Thank you. Supervisor Shuckley. Yeah, of course, I, I ditto what everybody says, and along with uh, Supervisor Crocker being here only four months, it's nice to see put some names with faces. Mr. Pacheco, we met out there that one time. Um, so, and, and having come from, um, you know, having 17 years of service at my previous employer, I, I know the importance of, of longevity, although I left to come here. I'm glad I did, and I look forward to meeting more of you um, in the future. And after the city council, I thought I was done with Bill Yacht, but I, I guess not. <laughs> hey, Bill. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, I just want to <laughs> echo all of the uh, comments of uh, my colleagues. You know, this is a great day that we always look forward to. It's, it's wonderful that we take the opportunity to recognize uh, employees who have shown dedication to this county and who have served for uh, 15 years of longer. 
you know, everybody always talks about the future generations, and uh, I'm glad that Supervisor Crocker and I represent the future generations. Some generations will be glad to see uh, go off into retirement. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, in all seriousness, as the baby boomer generation retires, uh, it's going to be more and more important for those of you who have the length of service that you have to continue to tutor, to guide, uh, to, to share your knowledge with the younger generation so that the institutional value that you bring to this organization isn't lost. You represent so many years of service, like Rhonda had mentioned, uh, 4,500 years of service amongst the uh, 90 or 100 employees that were recognized. That's incredible. Um, it really does uh, say it, it sa says a lot about Tulare County as an organization that you feel passionate about what you do to stay here for the length of time that you have served. Your service is appreciated. Uh, I know that every one of us has said that, um, but uh, please continue. Uh, and if there's anything that the board can do for you, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. We're all one family. We're in this thing together. You are the face of our county, and w an organization is only as good as the people that uh, work for it and work in it. And we are a great organization with great people, uh, and I think that this board owes you a standing ovation for the work that you do. So thank you. Now, CAO Spada says, get back to work, so uh, they can, uh, stay productive for this county. I'm kidding. But thank you all very, very much. I'll give you a quick minute to leave before we continue on with our business. Where's that big All right. damn clock of yours? Well, thank you very much. We will now uh, continue on with our uh, regularly scheduled agenda. Uh, we will take up item number six, which is a request from the health and I'm sorry. We will take up, uh, that is a timed item, but I will take up public comment first. At this time, is there anybody wishing to speak under public comment on an item that is not on today's agenda, uh, but is under the board's purview? I do have one request. Uh, from Mr. Sam Shaka to speak about an issue that's not related to walnuts. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, and I appreciate that comment. Uh, you know, when I heard you talk earlier, I talked about the family that you have with the county, and it's been a, a unique experience for me for the past couple of years. All of you have met me at one time or not in my career, but I've never had the relationship with you that I've had in the last three or four years, the sheriff, the district attorney, the board of supervisors, and I really feel flattered to be here and, and call you my family as well as the city of Isaiah. It's been a great experience, and I don't say that because I want something. I want nothing. You look like you could be related to Amy, though. So. Yeah, I know. People have accused me of that, but I deny it. Okay. I, uh, I want to tell you real quickly 
that I'm very, very excited today to tell you that the building that we developed in downtown Visay, and we still feel that the county is part of our downtown. We have the sheriff that helps us down there. We have the highway patrol down there. We have all kinds of different law enforcement people that are in our backyard in downtown Visalia. We have taken a 70-year-old building and converted it to a residential place. And today, I have to be very, very, very proud to let you know that Cuya Delta has put in a registered nurse for me today. They put a traveling nurse in for me today and a cardiac doctor who was transferred to Cuya Delta Hospital. So we had the properties available for the last two weeks. Three of the six units are already taken and people are moving in today. Great. I'm very proud to say that we took that building now. It's going to generate more property taxes. No property taxes were assessed in that building for over over 75 years, and now we're going to see a valuation which will create an assessment, which will help everybody. Win-win situation. So one last comment. Amy knows what I'm going to tell you now. Every year I'm very passionate about an event that we do in downtown. I'm going to invite all of you to that and your friends and anybody that you'd like to attend. A portion of these proceeds goes to breast cancer. We have been doing it now for 10 years in downtown Visalia. It's called the Downtown Expo. I feel it's time to share that with the county and let you folks know that you're invited. We like your support. Come down and see us. And it's a great event on May 19th. It's the car show weekend. It'll, we close the streets of Visalia. It's a great, great time for you to mingle with people. And Mike Almost will be the bartender for that afternoon. So. so will I. You have a question? No, I'll be a bartender too. You're on. I'm We've on. We've got you. And I just like to say, the the downtown living, the apartments are beautiful. And if you haven't didn't have a chance to see them, I don't know if any are still open for people. To yes, see, I have one more. So. They are they are amazingly. And like always, I always use up my time. I, and in <laughs> advance, thank you for letting me bring that to you. Thank you very much. Any additional public comments? Okay, seeing none, I will close the public comment period and I will bring it to the board to our regularly scheduled agenda, item number six. Uh, that is a timed item, 9.30. It is now 10.25. Um, this is a public hearing, a request from the Health and Human Services Agency to adopt fee adjustments. Uh, I love the uh, play on words um, for uh, Tulare County Health and Human Services Agency. Fee adjustments instead of fee increases. Fee adjustments, Okay, correct. it makes us feel a little better, fee I guess. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Vanderpool, members of the board, Mr. Spada, Ms. Peterson, Rob Stewart, Interim Director of Fiscal Operations for the Health and Human Services Agency. I'm presenting today our annual fee adjustments for fiscal year 2017-18 and a request for a public hearing along with that. We have fee requests from five divisions in HHSA, Environmental Health, Public Health, Animal Services, Child Welfare Services, and Public Guardian. Uh, I do want to note that as the Board of Supervisors has directed, we review our charges for services annually and propose uh, each year those that need necessary adjustments. Uh, the fees presented today do not exceed the reasonable cost of providing those services and have undergone review and approval by the County Auditor's Office, County Council, and the county administrative office to proceed to this point. Um, as we do not have any specific statutory provisions or specific adoption procedures for those today, we follow the general statutory provisions. Uh, we published a 10 day notice in the Visalia Times Delta and Tulare Advance Register on April 14th and the second publication on April 24th. First, the Environmental Health Division. Uh, this division acts as the agency responsible for inspecting and issuing various health permits in accordance with state regulations set forth in the California Health and Safety Code. For the Environmental Health Division, we are proposing four new fees, four fee description revisions to conform to amendments to the state code, and 27 fee increases. These are the four new fees on this slide. The first is bar with food preparation. Uh, currently, there is only a bar no food preparation permit, so this one would allow bars to serve a limited food menu. Uh, however, to differentiate from restaurants, the bar uh, would have to, the, the majority of the sales would have to be alcoholic beverages, but it allows them to uh, get this permit. Uh, it would actually be somewhat of a discount uh, relative to the restaurant permits that they uh, would currently have to get if they are serving food. The next two are 
Uh, licensed healthcare facilities, this is another new fee category uh, included in the amended California Health and Safety Code. Uh, you can see the two uh, categories based on the number of beds at a facility. Um, the amendment to the safety code, health and safety code, uh, identifies licensed healthcare facilities as food facilities uh, because they do serve food uh, to, to the clients there. So we are requesting that these be added to conform to the state code. And the requested fees here are comparable to uh, large restaurant permits. Uh, since they're new, we don't know exactly how much time they'll take, um, but we estimate that they will be comparable to large restaurants. And lastly, uh, school dispensing only. This is a new permit category that would be for uh, schools that dispense food but do not prepare the food on site. So it's transported from another school kitchen that does the preparation and then these schools would uh, dispense that food to the students. Um, this too, we've identified uh, uh, over 100 schools throughout the county that would be, uh, that would qualify for this permit category and it would be a, a lower rate than they are currently paying under the uh, school uh, with food preparation permit category. We have four description revisions in environmental health. Uh, two of them, we are also requesting fee adjustments. So the first is mobile food unit prepackaged food. This has been amended in the California Health and Safety C Code to include the word produce. Uh, so produce is now uh, included under this category for mobile food units, and we are requesting about a 10% fee increase uh, on, on that fee. Retail food facility, no food preparation, limited food display. Uh, this has been amended in code to no longer have the term limited food display. Uh, this term is specific for facilities that have less than 300 square feet of food retail space and sell prepackaged, non-potentially hazardous foods. Uh, limited food display Facilities are already being permitted under the permit called retail food facility, no food preparation, non-potentially hazardous food, limited food display. And there is no uh, requested fee adjustment with that one. The next two are temporary food events, three or more days. Uh, the code amended this to uh, three to 25 days based on a new definition of community events which are now limited to no more than 25 consecutive or non-consecutive days uh, of food sales within a 90-day period. So if it exceeds that 25-day uh, limit, uh, they could either get a permanent permit uh, as an established food facility or they could renew this permit. And uh, the first one there, the temporary food event, three to 25 days, we're requesting a uh, fee adjustment from 83 to 91 dollars as well uh, and, and the other one we are not uh, requesting any adjustment to the actual the description change we have 27 fee adjustments uh, proposed 20 of these are in our surveillance unit which is retail food inspections and recreational health which uh, is responsible for inspecting public swimming pools we have three in the Certified Unified Program uh, Agency, three in our Integrated Waste Program, and one in our Dairy Program. So the, the next slides uh, show all these 27 fee increases. I'll go through them. Uh, not, I, I won't touch on each one, but you can see here uh, we have tried to keep them to modest increases, uh, although we are not 100% cost recovered on all of these, but we are mindful of economic development and our clients and residents in the county. This is a continuation of those fee adjustments. These are for our surveillance unit as well. Uh, you can see, uh, again, modest increases for retail facility with food preparation over 10,000 square feet, bed and breakfast, uh, various restaurant sizes, uh, walk-up food, and nonprofit kitchens with food preparation, which is actually a lower rate uh, if they have proof of a 501c3 designation as opposed to uh, a regular food permit. And continuing here, mobile food preparation, uh, we have a couple of cottage food operations. The difference between 
the Class A and the Class B is that Class A uh, entails direct sales out of the home uh, or at community events, and the Class B allows that, but also indirect sales of food prepared at home uh, to boutiques or, or retail stores. Uh, bakery, and we have temporary food event one to two days that we're requesting the, the fee be adjusted from $56 to 62 and then temporary food event, uh, event organizer, multiple events. For a swimming pool, uh, this is part of our recreational health program. We're requesting a, a small increase in that. For the certified unified program agency, underground storage tanks, uh, this is uh, each underground storage tank must undergo an annual inspection to ensure uh, compliance. There's no leakage, um, proper monitoring and testing and so forth. Uh, we are requesting a 19.9% increase on that fee from $246 currently to $295. The state uh, informed us, the, the State Environmental Protection Agency uh, sent a letter dated April 5th informing us that they are increasing their surcharge associated with underground storage tanks. <coughs> so these are reflected here as well. Um, they informed us that for the 17-18 fiscal year, they are increasing their facility, UST facility rate from 35 to $49, which is a 40% increase, and the UST tank charge from 15 to $20, which is a 33% increase. Um, these are surcharges that we collect on behalf of the state and then remit to them. For integrated waste, we have medical waste large generator. So this is a facility that generates more, more than 200 pounds of, of waste. We have a modest increase proposed for that. For uh, body art, we have a couple of fees here. This is a fairly new program as of the last couple of years. We have modest increases to body art facility, uh, which was previously the annual establishment fee, and then also to the body art annual permit and annual registration fee. Uh, for cow dairy inspections, uh, we did have an error in the agenda item that I want to correct. Uh, in the agenda item, uh, had the wrong figure. The current fee is listed here. It's actually the 192.80. Um, the state for many years had not raised the uh, cap on the allowable monthly rate and we have a, we're well under 100% cost recovery in this program. Uh, last year they raised it, this year they allowed it to be raised again and so we are requesting that that be raised to the state maximum which is 208.87, it's an 8.3% increase over the current fee and even at that $208 rate uh, per month. We are, uh, the, the state, as you may know, takes a 15% uh, cut of that. And so 15% of the 208 means $31 goes to the state. Um, our cost is about $228, so we're about 78% uh, cost recovered at the requested fee of 208 so, Rob, I'll, I'll just stop you right there because that's, that's where I had questions and it clarified a little bit with uh, an email from Jason and then comments from you. Um, w one of the things that I have, one of the issues that I have with this fee increase presentation this year, first of all, they're all increases. Um, <laughs> and there's, there's no decreases. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, just the, um, the rationale behind these, you know, I understand that we're permitted to increase them. We're uh, trying to uh, attain cost recovery. I understand those principles that are driving this, but but did our costs actually go up? Some of these uh, aren't driven by cost recovery. Maybe it's the allowable uh, fee increase or allowable fee uh, existence from the state. We wanted to get up to that level. But, but I really want to know, are, are our costs really going up? Do we have to raise the fees to cover our costs or are we raising them just to raise them uh, and that's that's a concern that I have in general and I don't expect that you're able to uh, give justification behind each one of these fees but 
uh, each one of these fees deals with uh, really a broad brush of our society of businesses of uh, people in Tulare County in the unincorporated areas so I'm just kind of curious uh, uh, if you would comment to that sure um, just to give some background with respect to the environmental health division uh, in general a few years ago we had several years that we were not uh, able to get any fee increases and so our cost recovery has been lower as annual fee adjustments have not kept pace uh, with what our costs were at the time or with uh, increasing costs um, we do have marginal cost increases typically from year to year due to things like cost of living adjustments um, merit increases of staff things like that um, that that do increase our costs um, with dairy inspections in particular um, we have been far under 100 percent cost recovery there for some time uh, and the state held their cap uh, regardless of, of the fact that we and we uh, were, we're more impacted than other counties because we're the number one dairy producing county in the state um, but until the state finally after several years of not adjusting their cap they did last year and they allowed the cap to be increased again this year so we're not adjusting it simply in response to their uh, allow allowance of it uh, but because our costs are actually higher and it, it just increases our cost recovery and it doesn't help that they take a 15 percent surcharge to fulfill their their portion of the code as well public health division uh, we have some vaccine cost uh, fee adjustments proposed today uh, we provide vaccines to the public at the actual cost of the vaccine plus an administrative fee which is currently twenty two dollars um, in the past on the fee schedule the the administrative fee was actually embedded within each individual vaccine uh, fee as published and this year we wanted to separate that out uh, for billing purposes for proper billing it needs to be the vaccine uh, cost and then a separate administrative fee that's applied to it so we do have some decreases here uh, and that's due to largely because of uh, backing out that administrative fee that had been included within each individual vaccine cost um, but the admin fee was not charged separately in those cases so there was no overcharging it was simply embedded within each one uh, sure. have, yes. so, so essentially, I mean, we're saying it's a decrease, but actually it's not a decrease because we still charge administrative fee on top of that. Is that correct? Well, it, it may decrease because uh, the administrative fee will be charged one time uh, for each encounter. So if a client comes and they okay. have multiple vaccine okay. uh, shots administered in one encounter, okay. they would be charged the administrative okay. fee once as opposed to for each shot. That's, that's, that makes sense. Okay, thanks. So we have three fee increases and 12 fee decreases proposed for on our vaccines. Um, these are based, vaccine costs are something that fluctuate uh, throughout the year. Uh, as with any medication, the, the prices go up, they go down. And so we've based our proposed fees off of a three year trend analysis. Uh, and that resulted in most of them going down uh, due to the combination of uh, lower rates being available for longer periods of time but also backing out that administrative fee so you can see here um, each of the fees that we are proposing to either increase or decrease and this is a continuation of the other uh, to, to total the 15 fee adjustments on our vaccine For the Animal Services Division, uh, Animal Services oversees the county's animal licensing program, the enforcement of local, state, and federal laws. They respond to emergencies including dog bites, vicious animals, reports of animal neglect or cruelty, public complaints, and the day-to-day -day care of animals under the county's care and control in accordance with the Tulare County Animal Ordinance. We are proposing 16 fee adjustments for animal services. Eight of these are new fees and eight are fee increases.
this slide shows the eight new fees. Uh, animal Services is replacing its notice of violation process with an administrative citation process that pertains to the first three new fees proposed here. Um, how this will work is individuals will receive a, an initial warning in the event of a violation. After that warning, within a 12-month period, if there are additional violations, they will be uh, charged the appropriate fee, uh, one fee for the first violation and then uh, increasing for the second and third violation uh, for the same infraction. For, and this is for uh, administrative abatement if they, if they want to, uh, and, and it covers our direct labor time to document and enforce uh, the, the ordinance. The appeals hearing fee, this is for uh, dangerous or vicious animal hearings. If a client wants to appeal that, uh, this is a new fee, uh, $455 we are requesting, uh, where previously we have not been charging anything for an appeals hearing, but there is significant costs associated with holding those. The kennel reinspection fee, uh, this allows us to protect and, and to protect animals in kennels uh, from unhealthy conditions. This would be implemented in cases where uh, perhaps there were issues or findings on the initial kennel inspection, and now we are able, this would allow us to charge for a reinspection, uh, which is a, a lower rate than the initial inspection fee is. The breeder permit, uh, this is because uh, it's unlawful for any person to breed dogs for sale or profit or to advertise for the, for the sale or adoption of such animals without first obtaining a breeder permit. This is another new fee request uh, resulting from the update to the animal ordinance. And this fee would be charged on a per uh, female dog being bred basis. I have a question on that one. I knew you'd get fired up on this item. Yeah. Go for it. I'm not fired up. I just have a question. Um, how much enforcement do we have in that, and how do we know who's out there breeding? I mean, do we look at the paper, like the art, you know, the the classifieds, and see, and then go out and check on those? For the process, I'll turn to Patrick Hamblin, our animal services manager. And I'm curious too. What about cat breeders? <laughs> Walk down the street, you'll find them all over the. <laughs> As part of the breeder permit, this is initially being rolled out to our current license program or kennel licensing program for the commercial kennels, where they actually have to provide a detailed description of each animal, male versus female, and also has to align with the rabies permits. The breeder permit will initially be rolled out to those, and then as we're able to expand on our internal operations, then we will start monitoring it through the various sites who is actually taking place in a breeding process. Those who have more than one litter listed a year. Okay. All right, we'll stay on top of that one. Uh, and the reason I ask is, you know, obviously we know with the pet overpopulation and uh, puppy mills and whatnot being a, a big problem in our area. I'd like for us to make sure we keep on top of that. Thank you. Thanks. Next is the dog trap rental deposit. This is uh, one of our new fees. This would be a, a deposit where uh, for clients who need to basically rent a dog trap from us, they would put down a deposit and uh, we would loan that to them and then upon uh, Burn of that dog trap, we would return their deposit to them. The farm animal field surrender. Question. Yes. I'm sure. sorry. A dog tra is that? I mean, I know we have cat traps. Is it just big, like a cat trap, but bigger? It's not okay. And there are multiple sizes of it. Um, the. the so I know uh, we've talked about you know the whole community cat issue and maybe not taking those. So just want to make sure people don't start trapping all these cats that Pete wants licensed and. Yeah. The breeders and bringing those in so okay and and this is the same fee regardless of the or same deposit 
uh, regardless of the size of the trap needed, but there are multiple sizes available. The farm animal field surrender for goat, sheep, pig, uh, et cetera. This would cover the cost of accepting and processing farm animals, including uh, transportation to an alternate facility as may be needed for larger animals. Can we rent traps for those too? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we are proposing fee, uh, eight fee adjustments for animal services. Uh, the first is uh, to our boarding fee. This is a daily rate charged uh, for animals in our care. So we're proposing that be increased from $8 to $10 per day. And then the next three are related to dog licensing. So this is for unaltered. Uh, male or female dogs. Uh, there's a one-year, two-year, and a three-year option. Uh, basically, they get a discount uh, on the annual rate for if, if they obtain the license for a longer period of time. So the two-year and the three-year are a lower uh, annual rate than a, a single-year license would be. But we are requesting increases to those license fees. The dog spay and neuter deposit, uh, we are increasing, uh, proposing an increase of $50 to $60, that's a 20% increase. Um, basically, that's a, that becomes a, a down payment. Uh, we're pro promoting a foster to adopt program. So if clients want to uh, have the dog spayed or neutered, they would pay this fee, which then would be applied to the adoption fee. So they would then, it, it would, go into their uh, fee and reduce the, uh, the uh, remaining amount that they would pay for the adoption. So it's a uh, transitional deposit uh, to encourage people to adopt. The vaccination and, and deworming fee, uh, this is to assist residents in complying with the ordinance, covers the costs associated with medication, supplies, and labor time. Field surrender, we are requesting that be increased from $25 to $30, a 20% increase. Uh, this would cover the costs associated with accepting and processing animals being surrendered, including transportation, evaluation of temperament, behavior, and health to determine whether it can be made available for adoption. And then protective custody, uh, this is a daily boarding fee as well. Uh, we are requesting that, that be increased from $8 to $10. Uh, That's day. for animals who have witnessed a, a crime. They're in, <laughs> they're in protective custody. I figured you would yeah. know that. Mm -hmm. Witness a murder or something, yeah. put them in protective custody. <laughs> for child welfare <laughs> services, uh, what we're requesting is actually a consolidation here. Um, this relates to Assembly Bill 403, which codified the Continuum of Care Reform, or CCR which was passed in October of 2015 and became effective January 1st of 2017. Under the continuum of care reform, foster parents, adoptive parents, and relative caregivers were combined into a single category called resource families. Uh, so we are proposing then to adjust or essentially uh, consolidate, as you can see on the table here, uh, we would like to remove uh, the fees by those former titles of uh, LiveScan. So LiveScan is, is the uh, process that the Department of Justice requires uh, for any adult working with foster youth. Um, they charge us $64 for each one, but we are requesting a fee of $20 for these resource families. Uh, we, as part of the the continuum of care reform, we are increasing or receiving an increase to our allocation from the state that allows us to cover that difference so that we can make that more affordable and encourage adoption. So it, it would be uh, deleting the three existing fees and consolidating into a new uh, title called LifeScan Fees for Resource Families to be consistent with the continuum of care reform. And this one is a, uh, for Public Guardian, um, I'd like to request that this one be withdrawn from what was submitted. Uh, we were initially looking at a separate 
mental health representative payee fee. This is a monthly service that's provided to clients in the public guardian program. Uh, there are a couple categories. One is um, kind of the regular public guardian clients, and then one is public guardian clients who are also mental health clients. And so rather than uh, move forward with creating or revising a uh, mental health representative payee fee, we'll keep those under the single representative payee services uh, that currently exists, which is a $41 monthly rate. Um, however, the $41 is the maximum that can be charged. If the individual, uh, it's clients with social security or supplemental security income, and so if their income, if 10% of that income is less than the $41 fee, they are charged that 10% rate rather than the $41 here. So. Uh, request that that one be withdrawn and we keep that fee as is. Um, with that, I'd like to request that the board conduct a public hearing for consideration of these, uh, approve the requested fee adjustments, and authorize HHSA to implement beginning July 1st. Thank you. Any board members other than Supervisor Shuckling have a question or comment? Supervisor Worth. Just a quick comment. Um, you know, I, 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 fully understand and appreciate that we do this um, fairly frequently so we don't have these gaps and all of a sudden we come in and ask for 50% increases and that sort of thing. We've done that before and that is really a, a, a bad situation. Um, what, I, what I guess I, I think maybe um, Supervisor Vanderpool was kind of alluding to this is what are the efforts that we make to try to be more efficient with our services so we can keep costs down? And I'm thinking of the blue light special. Uh, you know, if you think about a dog vaccination, and so if you do your time and effort from the standpoint of one person coming into your office, requesting a vaccination, and having that person serviced, what is the time cost of doing that? Versus a vaccination clinic where 100 people show up and you have 100 dogs or 200 animals that are treated quickly, and the same person is devoted their time, there's a difference in terms of efficiencies. And so I don't know whether there, that there is the ability within the, the agency to provide those kinds of discounts, but I, I mean, we need to be thinking, how do we do things? It's not just about cost recovery, because cost recovery is, okay, we gave a cost of living increase to our employees. We, it's easy to say, to justify in fee increases based upon increased costs. We know we have increased costs. I've been on an air board that has increased costs like everybody else, but they've only done fee increases, I think, three or four times in their 20 years of existence. And, they, and they've, been in, <laughs> they've actually had the, the state come down and, and evaluate them several times because, like, how do you do this? Nobody else is doing this. One of the ways they do zero-based budgeting, every year they do zero-based budgeting, they look at everything they do. How can we be more efficient at doing this? Whether it's with IT, whether it's with, you know, how are we do it? And I guess my question is, what, do, what resources do we devote to that, trying to be more efficient? And I look at things like animal control and so forth. We want animals to be adopted. We want animals to be neutered. Every time we raise fees, we're cutting people out. There's just one more person that's going to say, I can't afford that. I, don't want, to, I want a dog, but I can't afford to do that. Or it's, I'm just going to go under the radar, right? So we want people to be law-abiding, we want people to do the right thing, we want to encourage them, and part of that is through finance. And when we make things so expensive that people just throw up their hands and they just don't, you know, they just, they go out and do whatever they're going to do, then we're, we're really hurting ourselves. So I just would like us to think about that in, in all of our departments. So we talk about rate increases, we, we understand that, and that, that sometimes there's no way around it, that no matter how good we are at what we're doing, it's costing us this much and we've got to recover that. What efforts are we being are being made to try to, to deal with this other side of becoming more efficient, or can we provide those blue light specials to people? Sure, and and uh, we can certainly continue to look at that on a program specific basis. It's it's a complex question to answer, but in general, uh, I would add that we do look at those types of things. I know in environmental health services, just over the last year, um, we've issued tablets to the inspectors, which allows them to complete the paperwork. Uh, more quickly while out in the field and move uh, more quickly from one inspection to the next. Um, so we do look at that in our programs and we are uh, mindful of, of seeking uh, operational efficiencies. 
Any other questions or comments, Supervisor Crocker? I, I guess I would just like to know what, how, how do we determine whether or not we want a rate increase or decrease? Um, you know, looking at all of these, the percentages vary from fee to fee, and the recovered costs for the total service, the percentage is varied. Some are 100%, others are 38%, some are 18, others are 78. So, I mean, what, how do we, we just throw out a number or? No, we, we do ongoing analysis on each of these each year. Um, like I said, with the vaccine costs, we look at a three-year trend of vaccine costs. Uh, for other programs, we do uh, maybe a rolling 12-month cycle to look at, at the cost of services during that year. Um, we, we do time studies for our staff that then we, we take the time actually used uh, or spent on each activity and we tie it back to that specific activity which relates to the fees presented. Um, so that allows us to, tell, to, to show how much time uh, was spent on each activity uh, and, and then we're able to adjust the fees based off of that. And sometimes there are policy issues where we will, you know, the board will say, look, we want to encourage or discourage this sort of thing, so we'll agree to not seek 100% recovery because there's other political uh, or policy benefits to trying to keep costs down. I think about the, the uh, temporary food thing. I mean, that was a huge issue a few years ago because, again, you can, you can charge a couple hundred dollars. You're talking about nonprofit organizations. They're trying to raise money, so we want to keep those low even though we may not getting 100% recovery, but because there's other, you know, benefits to trying to do that. Correct, and, and sometimes we have a, a big hole from, from prior years or uh, carryover from the Great Recession that uh, we want to incrementally dig out of, and so we're not having massive increases uh, each year. We, we are mindful of the consumers um, and want to keep the majority of the fees at modest increases, if any. And have we done any uh, type of study comparing us to our peer counties or our uh, other counties around us regionally or counties our size? How do our fees stack up to, let's say, Fresno County? I mean, is it a heck of a lot more expensive in Tulare County to own a, a cat than in Fresno County? You know, those are the types of comparisons I'm interested in, too. Sure, yeah, and that's another one we can look at, and, and we do look at uh, typically on a program-by-program -program basis. I know... Uh, animal services, for example. I don't know specifically, I'm not sure if, uh, Patrick, you know, um, but I know with other local, uh, like the municipal animal services agencies, our rates are lower, um, in many cases significantly lower than the rates that they charge. And how about for uh, the food permits and the uh, temporary event permits, the environmental health fees? Ours, ours are lower than uh, neighboring counties. I know with the underground storage tanks, for example, uh, many counties have a much larger fee for a single tank because there's time associated with the inspector going out to a facility, and then there's a, an additional marginal cost per tank on that site that they inspect. And so we do look at, at neighboring counties and see what they do and how our fees compare. Okay. And how we that, that's good because I always want to make sure that we are uh – uh, at least at average, and I always like to be hopefully a little bit less too. So we encourage people doing business in our county. Any further questions or comments? We, this is a public hearing, so once we're done, go ahead, Supervisor Crocker. Well, I guess I just, um, for future, I would like to have the storyline or the background as far as if, if the board has, has made a policy decision that, um, that has minimized or if, or if there is a gradual whatever the thought process is because of previous recession, that would be helpful for my benefit. Um, and I would assume for anyone reading the packet and the public to understand a little bit of, of the thought process. Um, and then uh, before the <coughs> public hearing is open, the, uh, so in the environmental health, the, the additional fees, there were two different sets of numbers. And so I just want to know what are the correct set. There was a, the, the different numbers that were presented versus what were in the packet for three of the fees. You know which fees those were as I'm looking through, I tried to identify them as well. 
it was school dispensing, uh, dispensing only, the licensed health care facilities, uh, the under 100 and above 100 beds. I'm showing that for licensed healthcare facilities, zero to 99 beds, uh, what was on the slide is $488. And in our summary of proposed fees, it was $488 as the proposed fee. Uh, for licensed healthcare facility, 100 or more beds, uh, 1,000 is the requested fee on the slide, and 1,000 is in the summary of proposed fees. So what was presented is the correct amount requested yes but it matches the amount in the in the summary of proposed fees as well is is there a different amount you're seeing yes i i mean i saw both so okay i just want to clarify okay any further questions or comments from board members no i'm just i'm just glad that we're revisiting this and looking at it periodically to make sure that we are at least trying to do a job yeah well we're Looking at it every year, I feel like. Um, is there, I, now with uh, questions, comments done by the board, I will open up the public hearing. Is there anybody here wishing to speak uh, regarding this item? Okay, seeing none, I will close the public hearing and I will bring it back to the board for action and or discussion. Move, Move for approval. Second. Uh, so I've, is there a possibility to pull the the dairy fee out and and leave it as is I mean we could we could do that uh, essentially um, I I mean it's uh, I well I, I, first off we have a motion on the floor but beyond that is the I mean the presentation was that I believe it responded to the chair's inquiry about just because the state raised the cap did we feel some yeah. obligation to meet that no the response was we're still well under our recovery costs and so and raising the fee actually takes it to the cap and it's really not it's that st and we're still not at the still not a recovery cost so i mean I don't know why it, i don't know why we would distinguish that from every other fee unless there's you know but but i also believe that the 15 percent cut it wasn't that increased uh or um, the, the state, have they not always taken a 15% cut or the percentage they take, was that increased this year? The percentage stays the same, but the amount goes up as okay. the fee goes up. So uh, yeah, previously obviously. they were taking $25 with the increase, the proposed increase to 208, they would be taking $31. Okay. So the, the state is going to take their cut. And I, I, I agree about um, not singling out just one specific fee, but I, um, I know that we had some questions about the um, what the regional uh, fees were uh, it, how my question we do have a motion on the floor and I get that um, we do have uh, time sensitivity uh, regarding this or is this something where we can get some additional information and bring it back in a couple of weeks with that uh, info to show the board what's what staff's desire we can certainly bring it back if that's the board's direction if there are additional questions or information requested we can bring it back on the dairy fees is we are the regional dairy inspectors for Kings and Tulare County so there really isn't many comparison yeah. counties just for point of clarification and, and I'm not but asking we can bring just on the dairy fee I'm, I'm asking for the oh absolutely the whole span of the fee structure yeah I mean absolutely we can always bring it back and have a different discussion um, we're just trying to keep within the board's policy of uh, cost recovery uh, we have a motion uh, on the floor from uh, Supervisor Worthley, uh, second by Supervisor Ennis. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, please vote. Okay. Uh, motion passes four to one. Uh, Vanderpool, Shuckley, and Worthley, Ennis, four, and uh, Crocker against. Motion does pass. We will now move on to uh, item number seven, uh, which is a request from the Ag Commissioner's Office to waive the second reading and adopt an ordinance amending Article 8, 
of chapter five, part six of the ordinance code pertaining to the theft of nuts. Marilyn? This item will have to be moved to the May 9th nighttime meeting in Tulare due to the change in uh, posting policy that our local newspaper has. They want a two to three day notice ahead of the putting it in the paper. Okay. Motion to, to, uh, to uh, move, see, set this matter for uh, further public hearing in two weeks from today. Okay. Uh, Which will be an evening meeting, I believe. In yes, it is an evening meeting. In is there anybody here under uh, wishing to speak uh, related to this under public comment? Okay. M Mr. Sam, before the vote, go ahead. <clears throat> Do I understand, Marilyn, right? We're going to move the public hearing to May the 7th? Nine. 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 And is there notification to the public that this is going to take place or how do we do that the clerk's office posts it in the newspaper okay it's just that I have a lot of growers who have been asking me questions about this and those comments have been coming back to me daily I'm sure you got it too and I just need to make sure that if that date because of the posting issues is pretty well set we can send out another postcard if the board okay. issues Okay, thank you. That'll work. All right. Uh, so we have a motion on the floor from Supervisor Worthley, a second by Supervisor Ennis. Please vote. Motion to continue this item passes unanimously. Now we're going to move on to the final item on our open session, and that is item number uh, 36. Mr. Washam. Good morning, Chairman, uh, Supervisors, CAO, and County Council. Uh, Mike Washam, RMA. I'm here for the uh, update to our Economic Development Office and request for a budget for our work plan for next fiscal year. So, so did you? I noticed your coloration of uh, back on that first slide was Blue? different on yeah, the E. The, the E D O is that to differentiate from the E D C, or was that just? It is solely to um, spell out the office. Okay, all right, and I like the UCLA Bruin blue. By the way, go ahead. I. Uh, I presented to the uh, uh, leadership uh, Northern Tulare County and Dinuba last week, so I'm going to briefly touch uh, a couple things because we have two new supervisors on board to kind of get where we're at with our economic development office. So briefly, um, the main goal of our economic development is improving the well-being of the communities through uh, job creation, retention, tax-based enhancements, and quality of life. In the broadest sense, economic development encompasses three three major areas, the macroeconomic policies such as monetary policy, uh, interest rates, those types of things are, are really out of our control, that's a national uh, level. Then the other policies are to provide infrastructure, domestic water, sewer systems, that's, and, and roads, that's, that's part under our purview, uh, provided we get some funding from the state and the feds. And then the third area is uh, improving the business climate, and that's what really the board has done over this past five years. This is our fifth year of the EDO, it was, it was in the spring of 2012 when we formed the uh, the office. So, as there's no signal, sig, um, single definition of economic development, there's really no single strategy or program for achieving success. Communities differ in their geographic uh, and political strengths and weaknesses. Each community is 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 unique, and it has its own sets of challenges for economic development. So as I said, 2012 is when we uh, formed the office, and at that time the general plan was just being adopted, and there's an there's a, uh, economic development element as part of the general plan that has a number of goals and policies. Just to highlight the, the six main goals are to, to maintain a healthy and diverse local economy, to promote growth and, and industrial diversification, and to diversify the economic base, and to improve labor and uh, force preparedness and enhance tourism and support downtown, town center type of uh, services, neighborhood services. So what we did was we looked at a regional analysis of uh, what's, what's Tulare County like to kind of form our basis of how to focus our direction. Uh, in agriculture, of course, uh, just about $7 billion in crop production last year. 
And what's unique about that is that's a higher percentage of Tulare County's gross domestic product than the surrounding counties. So therefore, we rely more on ag than, say, Fresno or Kern. And then we have natural resources that we look at. We have, we, besides the prime farmland and grazing land, we also have the Sequoia National Park and Balsh Park lakes and rivers in the, in the mountains. So that's something unique that, that Kern doesn't have the same and, and Kings County doesn't have the same. So Mike, we use that. I want to just, excuse me a second, Mr. Turn. We also have Kings Canyon National Park uh, and we have Sequoia National Forest. Absolutely. So, I mean, those should be listed right there at the top of you, the list. It, it, you're absolutely right. We are, uh, this is a very condensed, this was I gave to the leadership <laughs> I knew the last week. Uh, I think I spoke to them shortly after you did. And uh, so I just condensed about 12 slides into just two slides here to just kind of get us going. Uh, but point well taken. Uh, transportation, we have a major highway, we have main line and a short line servicing uh, our county and international airports within an hour. And um, the location where we are in the state is, is very centralized. We're between the three major ports. So there's easy access to West Coast markets as well as the international markets. Our workforce is young, motivated, and trainable, and with a very uh, relatively low cost of labor. So when we take all of that into consideration, we, we really formed our economic development office on, on the three areas. We, we had business opportunities, tourism, and the film commission. They each have their own unique place. Tonight, or today's presentation, basically going to be talking, giving an update on, on our business opportunities. That's broken down into a number of sectors we've, we've really focused on. The, um, the agricultural uh, food chain uh, and, and those types of industries and, and as they relate. So the, the presentation will follow this, uh, this outline here. <clears throat> Our BEAR program is, is business expansion and retention. And the program is really focuses on existing businesses because 80% of all job growth comes from existing businesses. That's, that's the key. You can, you can spend thousands and thousands of dollars in marketing and effort to try to get the next Toyota assembly plant and that could go down the drain and you, you really put a bunch of money out there and you're playing the lotto. Uh, whereas you could use that to encourage and grow your local businesses and get much more success back. And that's really our primary focus. We, of course, we're trying to get those big, big star players, but our emphasis is growing, homegrown. Uh, with this, we, we meet with our businesses, we uh, open the, the networking, lines of communication. Often this isn't, you know, we don't come to the door and say, we're, we're the government, we're here to help, you know, and then they <laughs> slam the door and lock, the, lock it tight. No, we're, we're there to create and build relationships, and that's really what, it, what it's all about. Some of the things that we find, you know, we're, maybe a business isn't necessarily ready to expand, but that's what we're there to help. But we find out that there might be a legislation issue that they're concerned with, and that might bring something new to our attention that we bring up the chain and something we can work on. So it's not just all about uh, building a new building, although that's what we're hoping for, new jobs, new buildings, but it's also that relationship building and, and those other aspects of businesses uh, that we can assist with. We created the business response team. That's a little hard to read, but what this is, we have a project review committee. But if, if we have a, a high, high uh, level develop, proposed development has a number of jobs, we will often bypass the PRC and we'll hold what we call an all, all hands on business response team. What we do is we collaborate with the developer and their engineers and whoever else they want in that room and we bring in the people that need to talk to them. We bring in the fire department, we bring in public works, we bring in the planning department, we bring in environmental health, we bring in all of those into one room so we can set, a, set, set down and discuss the project and we can work out uh, any questions that they might have or, or any concerns and we get that on early in the process because this is all about streamlining and getting these projects in the ground as quick as possible. And this saves time in the long run because a simple change of a line on a drawing at the very beginning doesn't cost you anything but the eraser to change the line as opposed to if that goes down and it's processed and plans are made, it's very costly in the, in further down the ride. So that's why we do that. We, we probably call these meetings six or seven times a year, eight times a year. We've, we've, our last two, I'll uh, talk about a couple projects we have uh, with uh, Moss Energy Works, as well as a prospect in the North County we just met with last week doing this uh, approach. And the developers really are uh, 
impressed with this because normally they, 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 they talk to us and they say, well, you know, usually we have to go to the fire department and then we go across town and we see someone else. And we, they like the ability to be able to get everybody in one room and one time and have a casual conversation, lay the plans out and discuss the project and find a pathway to success. <clears throat> Over the last five years, we've assisted with bringing um, community uh, clinics into our rural areas. Um, these, the, w the, there was four clinics that we did, and Sierra Care at the Lake, which is a congregate facility for uh, up, up in the Foothill area. The, uh, the total of what that has done is brought, it's brought 13 uh, medical providers, doctors, 66 employees, and over 3,500 monthly visits, both dental and, um, and, doc and medical. And we're working right now with four more. Strathmore, we're working on, on converting an existing office building for medical clinic. In Pixley, there was the mobile unit that's being brought in. Springville, the Sierra Care is planning a second phase and building a new structure, so they're going to be doubling their, their capacity there. As well as in Tipton, we've, uh, your board uh, vacated a road in preparation for an advancement of the medical clinic there to be able to expand. Once all of these facilities are completed, that will grow to over 102 employees total and, and over 5,500 uh, monthly visits in those communities that, that badly needed underserved areas, so it's a fantastic uh, reach. Then the other thing when we talk about business friendly and setting the plate for, for business, the, family, the two family health care networks in Terrabella, we had, um, had to change the zone because the zoning wasn't right. And they came in in July 7th of uh, 2015. They opened the doors for business December 15th, the same year. So in that short of a time, we went through the public hearing process, building permits reviews, and they constructed the project. We condensed that because we concurrently review things. And we, at that time, it was a record. We did a zone change with all the legal requirements and public noticing and CEQA in 59 days. But then now you look at Traver. Traver was, if, if this happened five years ago, it, we would have gone through the same process and we would have done that. However, we've updated Traver's community plan. We have much more buy right uses in those communities now. So in Traver's case, they went straight to building permits. So again, it costs, it, it's, it's a cost savings. They didn't have to expend the money for zone change and those types of land use entitlements. We're seeing that throughout the county. There's other examples of that I'll probably mention as we go forward. <clears throat> in our renewable energy sector, We've got 17 projects now that are operational for 287 megawatts. That's equivalent to taking 105,000 vehicles off the road. That's the, 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 the reduction in CO2 emissions. Or 69,000, 100% of the use of electrical use of 69,000 households. So we're, we're producing a lot of energy at those uh, facilities. Also with that, we, we created a, drop, a job training program with Proteus and they've trained over 1,000 people, and about 90% of those graduates from that program have, have uh, been employed in the projects we built here in Tulare, as well as Kings and Fresno. And most of those, again, we, we, we partnered with Proteus. We got the first, one of the first developers to donate um, solar panels, about $60,000 worth of equipment, to that program. They set it up so they had that state-of-the-art equipment to work on, and then they were working on the exact same things that once they got jobs in the field, they were already familiar with that. We also have a, an annual uh, revenue right now. Currently, it's $117,000 a year towards the general fund to offset police services, fire services, all, all the different general fund needs for these uh, facilities. And that will be stepping up another $75,000 once the, Ducor, four, the four Ducor projects go online. They're completed. They're, they've been finaled. But they haven't flipped the switch yet. They have to get the... the the good from the PUD to be, uh, to be able to flip the switch. Still in the renewable uh, energy sector, and you might have read about this in the paper yesterday, Energy, our Mo Moss Energy Works and Calgary are partnering for a regional anaerobic digester project, which is uh, a fantastic uh, project. They're covering, at this point, they're covering seven different dairy lagoons, and they're going to be piping the methane uh, in, via pipeline to the Calgary Renewable Fuels uh, pro, uh, facility and utilizing it to, uh, in, their, in their boilers for their Pixley ethanol facility. That is a fantastic project. We've done that, again, when you're talking about streamlining 
and simplifying and reducing costs, this project would have taken a lot longer in another county. We've been able to do minor modifications. Most of the pipelines run on existing dairies properties. We've got a little bit in the encroachment, about a three mile stretch straight down Avenue 118, I believe. Uh, um, on county right away. Why? On county, the county right, right away. Yes, and they, and we'll be coming to your board for uh, encroachment agreement for that, and that will be the final piece in this project. But the project's fantastic. We all actually are talking to another developer to do a similar, a little bit smaller, but a similar project. We have a meeting scheduled for uh, next Wednesday to discuss a similar project. So this is really the future of the dairy industry: is to be able to do this, to be able to capture that methane and not release it into the air and utilize it for good purposes. <coughs> Excuse me. Just while I'm talking about dairies, um, since May of 2015, there's been over 44 dairies have added. Approximately, most of them are about one megawatt of power each, each one. So the dairies are producing over 45 megawatts by themselves. And like I said, all of those, if you've been by the solar fields that we're talking about in near Ducor and Alpa, all told, that's about, right now, up and going, is about a little bit less than 300. But you're talking... 45 just on dairies alone and we don't monitor those as close because those are by right your board has uh, authorized that as a by right use on dairies so they strictly come in we see it as a building permit but that's nothing more so so again cost savings and and the dairies are really taking advantage of that one other project at Calgren is the biodiesel plant we authorized that through a minor modification of their existing special use permit, so it was done in a matter of about three weeks to, to process that. It's a $9 million expansion, and they're going to be producing up to 9 million gallons of uh, biodiesel from that where it would have been hauled away. Now they're refining it and, and creating another product out there. I mean, Calgary is really the state of the art when it comes to green technology. <clears throat> now to talk about Really, our primary focus is, is the ag business sector. Sundale Vineyards, after completing a $6 million project in 2015, has just submitted building permits for another $4.5 million expansion of its cold storage facilities east of uh, Tulare. <coughs> we met with them back in 2015. I, uh, Super Chairman uh, Vanderpool and, and myself sat down with them. We strategized and looked and said, okay, yeah, this is your plans here for the next couple of years, but what, what's your long term? What's your ultimate? So we got that all approved at one time through minor modification on their site plan. So now this time, they didn't have to even come in even for a minor modification. They already had it ready to go with their uh, just building permits. Seton Farms and Terrabella, they just, I, I, you know, the Winchester house, she continually <laughs> built, 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 built. I, I, Seton Farms is continually investing in the, in the county. They've, uh, they're under construction right now. I was out there not, not but a week ago. They're under construction of their 60,000 square foot new warehouse. They just recently put up another six silos that were worth another $4 million plus. Uh, they're just a, a great business, a great civic-minded business that provided a, a, a playground park for the community at their own expense, and, and it's fantastic. Pittman Farms, we've, uh, the poultry industry is really um, a cackles <laughs> in Tulare County. They're just growing, growing, growing. The reason Pittman Farms is chose Tulare County is because in, in, in Fresno, they don't get anything accomplished. And they came down here specifically for our permitting. We were able to uh, permit 35 new uh, uh, bird house or chicken houses. They're, these things are 50 feet wide by 500 foot long, state of the art with, uh, with ventilation systems. The sides come up in the day and the chickens have free rain out and then they all go back in at night. Uh, that build out is uh, over $15 million when they, when they fully build it out, but it actually will increase the capacity for poultry by about 30% when it's fully grown, uh, built out. Uh, Foster Farms is expanding their, their organic feed mill, and, uh, and Pittman Farms expanded by buying the old Calgon Gill um, uh, out in Hanford, and they've expanded their processing for, for their food, so they're, they're now they've geared all that up, they're, now they need to gear up growing. So there's some preliminary discussions about actually having a new facility as well, another ranch out there. So these are fantastic projects that we are um, working on. And, um, and again, that's just the top of the waves. I, I didn't mention the Tipton Cheese Plant, which is going to be a $35 million. It's crystal um, golden. They've already got the building permits in. 
They're demoing the building as we speak, taking down, the, what they're doing is taking down the older part of the building, about half of it, and then they're gonna rebuild and expand that and put some silos in. And it's about a 36, $37 million project, and that's gonna represent 150 new jobs for Tipton. So that's replacing about job for job of what was lost about three or four years ago when the cheese plant closed down. So that's, that's moving forward. We just met with a, uh, a developer for a North County facility, uh, food processing, and that's going along. We had one of those uh, uh, BRT meetings, business response team meetings, just two weeks ago, and we've we've got them in touch with the State Board of Equalization for some things. So they're looking at about a, a $2 million payroll, 50 people, and um, it's looking very encouraging. I, I got an email at 6.30 this morning asking for local contacts for local contractors and, uh, uh, and engineering firms because they like to have local companies develop those project, their projects. So that's encouraging and that's something that will be on the, the near horizon. As far as the industrial sector, we approved uh, S&S Metal Fa uh, Fabrication. That company is a relocation from Fresno County. It's just south of Kingsburg is where it's located. They demolished a, uh, a dilapidated structure that was really an eyesore and a nuisance, and they've just been issued the permits to construct, and they're building a 15,000 square foot shop. It's a half a million dollar project, and, and it'll bring 15 new jobs to the county. Stars Mechanical Heating and Air Conditioning, the company just opened a, a, a new uh, building uh, on the north side of uh, City of Tulare, right by the new uh, high, or the elementary school on that street, Liberty, I think it is. Uh, that was a relocation from a spot inside Visalia, someone doing something uh, kind of like a contractor thing out of a rental industrial area thing. So they, their business is starting to grow and they relocate and built their own building here. Uh, streamline Irrigation, that's, that's one of the companies that I, I'm really proud of. That was one of the, the ones that we first worked with as, as the EDO. We met with them in the, the old preschool uh, building uh, that Traver has out in their old surplus property on a rainy night in, 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 in uh, actually the beginning of the drought <laughs> in, in 2012. <clears throat> they were uh, a family owned business and they had four employees back in December of 2011 and they were subletting some warehouse space and they wanted to, they worked with us and we, we got them through the process. Uh, they were trying to go inside Traver, they weren't successful in finding a spot, but now it works out better anyway. That they've gone outside, they, we went through the permitting with them and the photo here, the one with the American flag there, they have, that was, grand opening was in Ju July of 2014. Well, right behind this building is a, is a sister building that they've just completed. So they've expanded twice in, in this time. And they've gone from four employees in 2011 to 49 full-time employees plus 120 additional seasonal workers. So it's, it's amazing. I mean, their product with, uh, with uh, water conservation and the streamlined irrigation, you'll see their, their name in fields and orchards all over now. And they're, they're really growing. And they wanted to stay within Tulare County, they didn't want to get up into Fresno, so we were successful in that. On the commercial side, Dollar Generals, we've built more Dollar Generals in, in these uh, rural communities. Pixley uh, is, com is complete now, Poplar is, is, is a fairly new one that just opened up. Strathmore, Farmersville, Tipton, we're under construction in Orosi, and we'll be soon coming to East Porterville. The Chevron gas station uh, that your board uh, approved uh, general plan amendment for on 65 and Teapot, they're on, they've got the grading permits and now the construction of the road widening is going on and they're, they're starting their expansion. We have the McDonald's that opened just about a year ago uh, and some others here. Uh, Family Dollar is, is under construction now or breaking ground on, on, a, on a Pixley location as well. And the other thing that I don't show here is there's, there, we have multiple uh, retail, commercial retail development projects, proposals in Goshen, kind of aligning with the, the Betty Drive, but we also have one <coughs> a little bit uh, east, right next to behind the Family Health Care Network, uh, and part of Self Help, Self Help is the property owner, they're selling the property. That's, that's a nice project, it's got multiple um, uh, tenant space there. There's one um, on the east side of uh, to Larry that's, that we've got it plans for, and, and that one was talking about potentially having a motorcycle dealership in it. 
So there's, there, we, we've got a lot of those projects going on. And, and one other good one is that we're meeting this afternoon at one with a developer down in Early Mart for trying to get a grocery store in the White River Plaza. So we're gonna be talking with Max uh, this afternoon. And I think that's coming real close to being a done deal. We also have community uh, development. We've got a number of grants that we're working on today. Uh, this is the, I was, I was assuming you would approve it, so I put it in the site <laughs> plan for the Rossi <laughs> project. Uh, then we, we're working on the, the Early Mart Neighborhood Park. We've got park projects in Ledbetter uh, and in Peter Malik with the playground amenities and, and the new play, uh, Plainview Park. Infrastructure, we're looking at expanding capacity in, uh, with a CDBG grant that we have for Traver Sewer. And we are working, obviously, on those uh, water systems in Munson and Yedham Seville, Oakieville, and working uh, with the state in East Porterville on that. Housing development, uh, self-help enterprises. We approved 126 uh, unit multifamily um, units in Goshen as part of their overall uh, Goshen Village uh, Phase 2. We've uh, just got uh, inquiries and they've received a will serve letter for Arosi for 38 single family homes in, uh, single family lots in Arosi. We have 11 self help homes in Traver that's moving forward. Uh, the Tribal uh, Housing Authority uh, approved the 27, we approved a 27 unit or single family home project in East Porterville. There's a 185 lot subdivision proposal for. A very North County, when I mean North County, I mean very North County, <laughs> Anderson Village, which uh, is immediately adjacent to the boundaries and actually will be developed in both counties, vast majority in Tulare County, but a, a few lots are in, in um, Fresno County in the city of Kingsburg. Another exciting uh, project that we'll be bringing to the Planning Commission actually tomorrow in this very room is the AT&T Broadband Project. This is a, a, a rollout. There was... $1.5 billion, I believe, at the federal level for this to, to be able to uh, get broadband to rural disadvantaged, uncovered areas in the nation. And uh, what that looks like in Tulare County is AT&T has a, is, is coming forward with, uh, they're going to be utilizing seven existing towers. They're coming forward with additional 29 towers. And this is going to provide uh, broadband uh, service to our rural areas and the planning commission tomorrow will be considering the first seven sites and we'll have representatives from AT&T and Erickson to do a brief a presentation of the overall uh, project and what it's all about but this is very important I mean I, I've heard I, I think it was supervisor Wordley that, that talked about how they the some buses some schools have Wi-Fi in their school buses and that these buses are being parked in the communities to be able to allow Wi-Fi service for kids to do their homework. So you see a, a bus parked in the neighborhood, a school bus, with kids in the, just kind of surrounding it in the general area and being able to get their Wi-Fi service. Well, that's great innovation, but this is the next step above that, to be able to have the, the service provided for the, for the entire community. And, and this is really one of my favorite slides. By right uses, we're talking about you know streamlining and, and allowing more things by right. What I've always told the CAO, I said, when you get, when you see this happen, is you know the strategy is working. When you see our use permits going down, and yet you see building industry and and, and permits going up, and that's what you see here over the last few years. Back in 2012, 11, 12, there were 70 special use permits, and the special use permit could could. Uh, takes time, there's, there's cost, there's uncertainty for a developer, whatever they're doing, and, there, and there's added cost. By our streamlining and, and looking at other alternatives for permitting and using minor, uh, minor modifications for existing permits, as far, but really the big key is the rezoning as part of our community plan updates to be able to allow more by right uses. You've seen the, the full use permits dwindle uh, significantly while you're seeing permit activity still continue to rise. So that's, that's, uh, that's my favorite slide, actually. <laughs> then we also have the tourism component. The EDC, the EDC, um, backed out of the tourism marketing piece in 2011. And then a new coalition of local tourism partners uh, formed the Sequoia Tourism Council. 
and started a collaborative regional tourism marketing effort to pr promote Sequoia Kings Canyon National Parks and, and the Forest Service, I did get it in, uh, <laughs> and our local communities. So the details of that budget plan are, are, is in your attachment. Then also in, in our Tulare County Film Commissioner, we really encourage filming activities. Uh, there's offshoots for when, when, when companies are here filming. It's not only is it the, the free marketing and advertising of the great places in, in the county, but it's also hotel night stays, it's, it's, it's restaurant spending, it's gasoline taxes, it's all of that. And the details, the TCAG funds $50,000 of, of the budget and, and 20,000 is, is the request of your board to be able to contribute to that budget and the details are in your packet. So with that, I would, uh, well, one last slide. All of this, all of this performance has really uh, been through the leadership of, of, of the CAO. It's been a collaborative effort between Public Works, the Fiscal Services, the Economic Development Planning Branch, but it's really the strategic management approach that, that was implemented by Mr. Spada and uh, it's just projected that these advancements will, will continue to increase in the coming years. And with that, that concludes and then just request that approve the various uh, plans. Okay, anybody have any questions or comments? No, just a comment. I can certainly see over the last couple of years how much the economic development throughout the unincorporated areas of, of Tulare County has improved immensely. And the Film Commission, what they've done, the people they've brought in, uh, the tourism, I mean, it, it truly has expanded over the last two years. You can truly see the difference in it. Thanks, and a great presentation. You guys are worth well, it. just one quick observation. I, I, one thing that's very impressive is that when you look at the economic development and the capital investment, the number of jobs generated is really quite incredible. I, I just saw an article the other day where Ford Motor Company was going to invest $1.2 billion in uh, expanding their capacity uh, someplace back east. Re regenerating 119 jobs. I mean, so you look at the amount of capital investment here for the number of jobs we're getting. We're getting a much, I mean, we, we're beneficiaries. It's the, it's the businesses that are doing it. But a lot less money is generating a lot more jobs. And at the end of the day, that's very, very important for us because we've got to have employment for all of our folks. And so this is very helpful, provides additional revenue to the county, which is greatly needed and, and important. And as a, by the way, I think it's a great offset since we have a, uh, uh, an agricultural economy, which is, you know, our ag land is dominated by Williamsnack contracts, which generate very small amounts of property tax. Um, this is an offset for that. The ability to have ag-related businesses co-locate on ag land and generate this amount of property tax and sales tax, it actually enables us to continue to be the kind of county we are, I think, promoting agricultural production and c continuing with the Williamsnack contracts. That's not the case in every county. Imperial County has filed notice of termination of all their Williamsnack contracts because they just like they couldn't afford to do that any longer. So it's a really good story going forward for Tulare County. Thanks, Mike. Supervisor Shuckley, if you ask for permission, you will I get wasn't to asking speak, for permission. But, um, hey, Supervisor Crocker, would you like to make any comments? I, I would. Okay, go ahead. Thank you for following Robert's rules of order, Supervisor. Go ahead. Well, I uh, I, I just want to thank the staff. I uh, I never met Robert, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is this is very impressive, and uh, I I know I've shared with some of you already, but I've met with. Um, some of the business owners and the individuals that are working on some of the projects listed and um, just publicly I they express their uh, sincere gratitude to the staff of Tulare County and and the the working relationship that you guys have been able to provide and and really uh, back up you know it's, it's one thing to say that we're business friendly but um, I, I think this proves it and so it's 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 a matter of of practicing what we preach and so I so I want to extend my thanks um, there was a mention of or there was in the packet there was talks about uh, private donations for the film commission yeah what does that look it, like it, what that looks like is <clears throat> we don't have set fees for uh, filming permits in the county because so, we don't want to discourage low budget we want to encourage everybody so what the, the creative way of, that we're doing this is is the Film, filming uh, entities can often give us a donation, okay? And, and the donation may vary in amounts. 
What's happened in the past is if we get a donation, it's like, well, what do we do with it? How can we, uh, you know, the, the fiscal transaction. So what we've done is, because uh, we would always have to come to your board for a whole agenda item just to take a check for $500. So what we've realized is to, to plan ahead and be proactive, we've put that $50,000 there in anticipation that we can get up to $50,000 of donations, potentially, uh, without having to come to the board because we've got a place to set it. But it's not an outlay of, of county expenses. It's solely a place to deposit uh, funds if and when we receive donations. Okay. Any other supervisors wish to speak? <laughs> um, yeah, I'll say Supervisor something. Just so go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you. A very thorough report. A good... Um, I lost track here. It's it's what impressed me the most and what stood out to me was the, the development in the unincorporated, the more underprivileged, like with the dollar generals and, and things like that to give them the resources and also the agribusiness sector. Um, you know, we are the number one ag county, so it's important to support that. Where where are we in, in terms of any overlap or comparison with Tulare County EDC? I know we're not a part of that organization anymore. Um, if we were part of that, would there be a lot of overlap, or is there anything that they could do for us that we're not doing in our organization? And real quick, let me just, uh, I was letting everybody else speak, but you're right along the same thought that I had. Looking at the, the Business Opportunities Work Program, I looked at professional dues and memberships. You know, uh, Mike and I had spent some time meeting with the uh, Tulare County EDC, um, and, and we've had some good conversations. We didn't really come up with a specific number of what that would look like uh, for the, the county to be a supporter. I, I don't want us to get back into a situation where we are a full dues-paying member uh, spending, I think we were spending about $80,000 a year. Um, I would rather see us invest that money right here in our own uh, business opportunities program, uh, but what I do think we could do is we could add a five thousand dollar line item in the professional dues and memberships section of this agenda uh, or of this program, um, and offer that as a support, a sponsorship. A in your presentation, you mentioned collaboration and how uh, this whole program has gotten to where it is because we've worked well within the resource management agency. You've worked well with the tourism side. Um, I, I think that all efforts exerted towards economic development, regardless of who's putting forth the effort, uh, if it brings something to Tulare County, it's going to benefit us. So I think this would be a great opportunity, a great portion uh, to, to throw that out there, to offer it. We don't need a voting seat on the EDC as we had before. This is just a, a sponsorship like a, like a company would do uh, to the EDC to show our support and collaboration. And they did say that they would be amenable to that uh, when, when we met with them uh, last. So uh, Mike and I just hadn't really talked and formalized what this would look like. But I, I'm in agreement with you because there are some there is some value that we could get from uh, being affiliated with the EDC that would reduce current duplication of resources. I understand they have some computer programs and things like yeah. that to do studies would that five thousand we need to find out would that five thousand dollar membership allow us access to that right also uh, again real I, estate and, database. And, and we have coordinated we do coordinate continually with the edc where it's not that we're yeah that, as we do with all cities as well sure the the duplication of 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 costs uh, that we could eliminate potentially the EDC has um, <clears throat> some software programs for, for fiscal impact analysis, which is great. So like when I say a job is coming in near Kingsburg that's got 50 jobs and it's a $2 million payroll, they can say how that's going to play out. And, and, and that's something that costs probably a few hundred dollars per each report that you do. They have a subscription to a service that can provide that. So that's some places we can utilize that. Also when we're talking about retail, when we talk about like the Dollar General or something, Early Mart was a difficult sell. Well, especially like the grocery store. Let's let's yeah. use that as an example. You know, it's a difficult sell because of the number of rooftops and the demographics. They that's what they look at. Site selectors. Uh, that's one of the main factors they look at. 
we can do an analysis for a site through their computer software. We'll, we'll say how much the rooftop, how many rooftops in the in the in the uh, territory. We can flex that and, and change that out. It gives the demographics. It gives all those types of things. So when we go down there and tell them and, uh, that you know you're going to be reaching this type of thing, not just what you see here, but from out the outside, uh, which is what we did with Dollar General, saying you're going to get Rich Grove and you're going to get Alpaw coming into uh, Early Mart. And they didn't believe it at first, but then when they saw the numbers, that, that, that's why they're here in such forces, because Early Mart beat all their sales expectations. So there's computerized programs that we would have access. They also have a film studio. They're, they're really a marketing, and, and they call themselves, it's a marketing uh, program, really, to market Tulare County. There is, sometimes there's some confusion in... Um, in the marketplace when you have Tulare County EDC, you have Tulare County, you know, so there's a little bit of overlap there as far as positioning. But uh, we certainly can, can look at that. I would say that we could propose, I, and I was thinking that we'd be coming back for a, a, an agenda item to give the board options about participation levels being status quo to full membership and some steps in between uh, that, that could be uh, whatever your direction is, is what we'll, we'll follow. Uh, but I see that there can be that. We don't have, if we can rely on their staff to, to do something that we would have to be otherwise paying our staff for, that's, a, that's probably the biggest cost savings. If we can say, hey, here's, here's a, a, a prospect, and here's a site that we think might work, and if they can run with it, that's, that, that's cost savings to us as far as having to, to generate all of that. It's, it's, it's staff resource issue. And I, 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 sure. I think it shows uh, goodwill also. Yeah. Well, when corporations, industry look to TCEDC for possible location and to get information, to see that the county is a partner also with them is very important and plays Absolutely. a big role in that. So maybe maybe the idea is a proposal of up to let's say ten thousand. Well, we're not taking hard numbers today. I mean, as far there, we will come back with the budgetary process. I think we can do it at that time. We don't it isn't aren't we adopting the work program? It's a work the program. program. That's the formal could, budgetary action, or is that you want to do well, something apart uh, from? Uh, the reason we come at this time is we like the flexibility and spending authority to be able to hit specific things that are itemized in there as far as. Um, trade shows that we need to get a booth in or, or those types of things that we really can't wait until we get a break if we get them now and, and we want that flexibility to be able to okay. spend the spend the money that have the authority. Okay. So, so I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm open to whatever uh, process we need to undertake, but I mean, well, I, I, I'm, I'm currently not, uh, not I'm not, no, I'm not no leaning towards to formal proposal. membership like we had in the right. past. No, I have no objection sure. to your proposal. Okay. I, I, so, I mean, I don't care if we want to try to incorporate that into the motion today or whether we would do it later, the formal budgetary process. Either way, we'd be doing the same. I, I think we can incorporate it into the work program of up to $10,000 and, and give Mike the flexibility to negotiate with the EDC uh, as to what that would, to would be it. like. <laughs> And I want to know, and I get, but I want to know what we're getting for the ten thousand dollars. So right. I think I think Mike's laid out a plan. So maybe says, come back with, yeah, with yeah, the, a work a work program that provides us with real value coming back, not yeah. just here's a here's a donation. Thank you very much. Sure. What do we get back from it? So. And I'll be attending the meeting right. tomorrow. Also okay. As an oh. invited guest, check it out. Okay. I would move approve the. Hey, is there any public comment uh, related to this? Okay. Seeing none. Move uh, approval of the project uh, of the uh, proposed information as today, and also with the, the information that we talked about as far as potentially uh, being a, a portion or a member, or supporter, supported, of, supporter, supporter of the yeah. of the Tulare County EDC Corporation. Second. All right. We have a motion by Supervisor Worthy, a second by Supervisor Shucklin. Uh, the votes have been cast. They are unanimous. Thank you very much for the presentation, Mr. Washam. And uh, that does conclude our open session agenda. Council, do we have need for closed session? We do, Mr. Chairman. Item A is off calendar. Items B through H will be heard in closed session, and I expect at least one announcement out. Okay. Thank you very much for attending today's meeting, and have a great week. What did you say? It's item B? Is in boy? B is in boy. Yeah. This is Deanne Peterson, County Council, reporting out on April 25th, 2017, on closed session item B, 
Lonnie Bowen versus Tulare County Sheriff's Department Sergeant Winslow. Tulare County Superior Court Case VCU 267680. On the motion of Supervisor Stephen Worthley, seconded by Supervisor Mike Ennis. On a 5-0 vote, the board directed legal counsel to defend Sergeant Doug Winslow with a reservation of rights. This concludes the reporting out for April 25th, 2017.